Jennifer Dana. Nice to meet you as well. All right, please rise for the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. But this time, each mayor will uh, introduce our council. So I will start first. Uh, I am uh, Council Member Tammy Deedy, Mayor Pro Tem, and uh, our Council Member, Council Member Page, our Council Member uh, <laughs> Christiana de Leon, um, and Council Member Theron Smith, and Council Member Nate uh, Jones. And Councilmember <laughs> Lee Mobile. Um, I think we're and Councilmember Brad Douglas is uh, not here today. Is he on the phone? He's out. Of town. Oh, he's out of town. Okay, so uh, uh, Mayor. For the for the record, I do feel uncomfortable in the workplace because I'm sitting between Black Diamond, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> Councilmember Victoria Schroff right there. Sorry. <clears throat> Councilmember John Herbert, right there. All right, Councilmember Deedon Pearson, right here. Councilmember Sid Dawson, and Deputy Mayor Dana Pernello. Yes. And Councilmember Les Burberry is uh, not feeling well. He gives his regrets. This is one of his favorite meetings of the year, but he will not be able to hear, be here today. So thank you very much. And I'm Sean Kelly, in case uh, anybody didn't know who I was. You know who I am? Just want to make sure. <laughs> All right, Mayor Wagner. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Mayor Wagner of Covington, and I'll introduce <laughs> Jennifer Hardenhausen, Christina Soltis, Mayor Pro Tem Sean Smith, Councilmember Beth Porter, Councilmember Joe Samomo, and Councilmember Debbie Hartsock is out of town, enjoying herself on vacation in Spain. Yep. <laughs> Yep. All right, so um, I have opening remarks, just kind of a little uh, history a little bit. Uh, so good evening, everyone. Welcome to the 16th annual Tri-Cities meeting of Black Diamond, Covington, and Maple Valley. Uh, the purpose of the gathering is to share information about our cities. Um, uh, sorry, about uh, is to share information about what each city has been doing and to learn from one another. By working together, we can build stronger partnerships and achieve our common goals uh, as we move forward. And, you know, each city is growing. We're all still having, you know, I, I think Covington and Black Diamond and Maple Valley are still having growing pains. So we're all learning and, and trying to figure out everything. And, and as we come together at this meeting and uh, talk, you know, with our city staff and everybody together, I think, you know, it makes those bumps in the road a little better. So welcome everybody. And then uh, today is uh, Reagan Dunn here. We have a presentation. Oh, he's online. Hey, Reagan. Uh, we have a presentation Hi. of King County Council update. Um, and at the end of your update <coughs> presentation, each mayor does have a question for you. So welcome. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Deputy Mayor. We got a PowerPoint presentation. Great to see everybody. I wish I could be there. I couldn't be in two places at once. But uh, I am eager to present to you what we got going on at the county. A lot of action, a lot of new development. So uh, I try and hit this uh, this important meeting that you all have, the three cities, uh, every year. And I'm really glad that you all take the time to meet. I think it's really critically important. And I wish more communities across the county would take your lead and do the same thing, because I think it's good for regional planning. Let's go on to the first slide. <laughs> going to run through some issues here, redistricting, substance use disorder and overdose stats, crime, the court backlog issues, uh, the budget, we're in a budget year, and some, some grants coming and then take questions, as uh, Deputy Mayor uh, said, uh, and hear from you on what's important to your particular city. So let's go into redistricting. Next slide, please. Um, before we yeah, before I get to redistricting, just real quick, again, this year I serve as 
uh, a vice chairman of the King County Council, myself and Gurmai Zahalai, our vice chairs in Upton Grove is the chair this year. I'm on local services, law and justice, government accountability and oversight, regional water quality committee, uh, committee of the whole. And then again, uh, this year I'm chairing the board of supervisors for the King County Flood Control District. So pretty similar assignments as we had last year. Next slide, please. So we did go through redistricting in 2021. Um, it changed uh, pretty decent sized changes there. Basically District 9 uh, took over a much larger percentage of the Enumclaw Plateau right up to, to the Auburn boundary, uh, about 15,000 more people uh, in that uh, particular part of it. I gave some of Renton away took a little bit more of Bellevue, the area that I grew up in. Um, so there's been some shifting. Basically, the rural districts get bigger. The urban districts get smaller um, as in terms of what uh, has to be the land that's taken into the district. So uh, that is what it looks like. It doesn't really impact the three cities that you guys are, are meeting together today as, except I got rid of the, the, that eastern portion of Kent by Lake Meridian, which I really enjoyed having. Um, still have the watershed. But anyway... Uh, next slide, please. Okay, let's uh, switch gears over to substantive issues, and this one is 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 a big one. Um, the chart on the right, the colored graph, shows uh, fatal overdoses in King County, Washington, over the last ten years or so. And you will see that over the last five years, there has been a dramatic increase in the number of deaths related to uh, overdose. Um, there were uh, 1,311, so nearly four per day uh, happening uh, in 2023. That number is roughly the same this year. We'll see what summer brings. But what we're seeing is fentanyl, leading cause, followed closely by methamphetamine, uh, followed by really the combination of meth and fentanyl together is what's really lethal. Cocaine is coming up as well. For every fatal overdose, there are roughly six non-fatal overdose. That is not a curve that we want to see. Uh, there are a lot of different reasons for it. Um, you know, I think the pandemic isolation had something to do with it. I think the social media and 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 you know all the challenges uh, for young people has something to do with it. Um, the availability of drugs has something to do with it, and I think a relatively poor response from the county in terms of lack of critical. Uh, infrastructure for behavioral health challenges is adding to the problem. So, you know, it's out there uh, here. And next slide, let's move to the next slide. This is the fentanyl uh, number. It's fentanyl now the leading cause of death for folks 18 to 45 years old. And, and so obviously that's an 880% increase. Uh, I put some legislation forward a year or so ago, making fentanyl a public health crisis, which was good. Hey, we're doing some things to try and combat that, uh, like Conference on Substance Use Disorders, which is coming up June 6th. Love to have you there. The Laced and Lethal uh, Overdose Prevention Campaign. It just takes one pill to take a life. Um, we are really uh, trying to push these things because that uh, that public health problem is it, it doesn't every race creed color religion sexual orientation it doesn't matter it is indiscriminate and it is it is tragic i mean it's claiming you know three times four times almost uh the number of lives that gun violence is claiming in king county so it's a very real problem next slide please here are uh some this the don't count us out campaign uh that is in addition to the laced and lethal campaign which is really more of a educational campaign to try and get parents and kids to understand the dangers of fentanyl. The Don't Count Us Out campaign is focused on destigmatizing people that choose to go into recovery, that people can turn their lives around and make a big difference. We're among the first in the nation doing that. And it's a, we won an award for it. And it's just important for folks to know that, uh, you know, you can recover, you can make a difference in your community, you can do a lot of good things and we should celebrate that, not condemn it. And then the conference on substance use disorders uh, is happening uh, at Highline. Community College on the 6th of June, love to have you there. And there's a registration number if you're there, it's nine to three. We get we had almost 700 people there last year. So it's a good group, uh, we'll be doing it every year. Um, and I think it, it goes part and parcel with the that huge increase in, in uh, 
uh, overdose deaths, right? So we've had this for four years. We've seen those increases for four years. This is an attempt to try and combat that and do information sharing. Next slide, please. This is uh, our criminal justice system caseload at King County Superior Court. And you'll see the tidal wave of the pandemic hit us pretty hard. A lot of trials had to be stopped, in-person jury pools, et cetera, civil and criminal, all of it really uh, created a backlog. And, uh, and then we're trying to work through it. We've got some increases in property crimes and increases in violent crimes adding to it. Uh, we put a lot of money towards additional uh, resources for the court and different staff, staffers about a year and a half ago. And you'll see that I sort of starting to make a difference uh, in terms of bringing that caseload data down. But the jury's still out. So let's hope let's hope we can, in fact, bring that down because it's not fair to to defendants. It's not fair to uh, the business community, to individuals who are in family law or custody disputes or uh, individuals who are trying to get restraining orders, whatever, all of, all of us. Uh, it's not fair to have a backlog. The courts need to do their job and we need to help them. So there is a, there is the, the data on the court backlog. Next slide, please. Talking a little bit about drilling down on the violent crime spike in King County. So King County has experienced a dramatic increase in violent crimes, um, spike in gun violence and homicides. Homicides are up uh, 73% since 2019, um, and firearm violence has gone way, way up too. Um, it's doubled uh, over the last four years or so. So um, we know for every fatal shooting, there are roughly three non-fatal shootings. So there's a lot of activity uh, here. Uh, we we know the demographics are roughly 86% male, um, and and a significant portion uh, were young and a significant portion uh, were of color. That's what the data uh, tells it, which is unfortunate. We all want to see those numbers go down uh, moving forward. And, and I, I, I pray that they will. And a lot of ways, I think, to do that, much of it is doing being done right now. But we can talk about that as well if you want to ask questions on it. Next slide. Uh, public safety. Um, hiring and retention. I've been working hard to try and get um, those officers hired. Um, we are down, we were uh, as high as 114 vacancies. So through the pandemic, we kept those uh, officers funded at the sheriff's office. But for a lot of different reasons, some of which I agreed with, some of which I didn't agree with, uh, we were down as many as 114 vacancies. And that's a lot. Um, the sheriff, Patty Coltindle, I think has done a nice job of bringing that number down to just 70. So we still have a long ways to go, but um, it is important, I think, to all of us, especially for those cities that live in and around unincorporated King County or contract cities uh, like Covington and Maple Valley to have a fully staffed police department, as you guys know that even better than I do. Um, we have put some more FTEs in for gun violence um, and for some community and special programs and some detectives. We've done a gun violence emphasis team, which is a recent appropriation, um, uh, some other programmatic work, emphasis enforcement areas, and a bunch of money for body cameras as well. But I'd like to hear from you on uh, if you have any questions or concerns about how the department is running, how the sheriff's office is running, or how we I can be helpful on the council. Next slide. There's some familiar faces, folks in Maple Valley. Um, so uh we made a, some significant investments in the biennial budget 6.5 million um for uh helicopter uh and 1.7 million for the new park ranger program and the uh, mid biennial budget also provided a million for ongoing funding um to deal with the uh, public disclosure stuff for body cams which is important the pao has, has requested uh, uh some paralegals and additional staff support which i i support across the board uh, those improvements. Next slide. So um, in addition to the uh, the supplemental budget, we've got uh, some significant things happening um, for uh, what's happened in 2023. 
we cut 15 million out of the biennial budget general fund. The 50 million cuts mostly in the form of eliminating vacant positions, including uh, 13 FTEs at the sheriff's office. The mid biennial budget also made some investments uh, reimbursed uh, by the state to provide housing and hotel rooms for asylum seekers and some other work that we've done there at the Tuckwilla Church. Um, there was some money for restorative community pathways, uh, which is a controversial mm -hmm. uh, program for sure. Um, and uh, the council, uh, obviously there were some folks that voted no uh, on it for a variety of reasons, which I'm happy to go into. Um, the 2025 budget, uh, uh, the cuts are expected to be more than 35 million. There is a, uh, so it'll be a pretty ugly budget. There's a uh, public uh, hospital property tax that's been proposed just last week by the executive um, for Harborview, UW and public health. Um, and that will be a councilmatic vote. So the nine King County council members will vote up or down on implementing the tax. It doesn't go to a vote of the people. And the following biennial budget, just to showcase, they're expecting at least a $50 million in additional cuts. So the the, the revenue uh, forecast is kind of bleak for the county moving forward. Next slide. Oh, my goodness. There's Jeff Wagner. There's Sean P. Kelly. Um, some grants, uh, 626,000 community grants secured for the Tri-Cities uh, area there. And... Uh, uh, some money in parks grants, 1.8 uh, million for culture grants, uh, 38 grants uh, as well, nearly $200,000. Uh, the Aquatic Center in Covington there, uh, help for the jerseys for the for the Tahoma Bears uh, varsity football team, among other things, I think. Next slide. A lot of uh, community and open space investments. Uh, it's Mayor Wagner there. Uh, uh, yeah, and the Cedar Degree uh, River Trail has been something we're focusing on. Um, a lot of work in Black Diamond Open Space, uh, Ravensdale, Cedar Park, Rock Creek, Dory Don. Um, Flood Control District is uh, uh, putting in a significant amount of money there, $1.3 in a variety of uh, of ways. There's, the, there's everyone from Black Diamond. That was a beautiful, sunny summer day. All right, next slide. Okay, Cumberland Mining, that's the Sigali property uh, way out, uh, as you know, not far from Black Diamond, but what, out east at the, uh, really at the base of the Cascade Mountains. Uh, so that Sigali's proposed mining project out on his property, uh, there is no application to change the zoning for this. I just want to be clear about that. Um, the zoning already exists, has existed for a long, long time. And so the decision on whether the permit shall issue is under the jurisdiction of the King County Executive uh, but uh, and the Department of Local Services the Permitting Agency. So people come to me all the time, well, you know, you you shouldn't zone this for this. You know, it's it's zoned. Uh, they're vested. Uh, so anyway, that there's nothing we can do about it. But but uh, the permitting agency uh, needs to take a good hard look at this. And make decide whether this should be a determination of significance for the project, which I believe there should. Um, and I, I hope that permitting does, in fact, do that. Um, a lot of folks have reached out and uh, have, have put in input on this. So um, keep your eyes peeled on that. I know it is it is an issue that is controversial in a lot of different ways. Um, so happy to talk about that, too, as well. But I wanted to give you an update on that. We should have the next month or so an answer on that. Next slide. Okay, uh, more questions. I think um, by and large, you know, county government is 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 running fine. We have budget challenges. We have policy uh, challenges um, that are, are, some things are going really well and some things are not going well at all, like any government. And so I'm doing my best to represent District 9 and Black Diamond, Covington, Maple Valley, uh, to the best of my ability in unincorporated areas. And, and uh, at this point, I'll, I've presented enough. Let me just open it up to questions and see what, what you have. All right. Uh, are we opening it up to everybody? Just the, no, the yeah, okay. Uh, duration of time. Great. <laughs> okay. So, um, well, I'll, I'll go ahead, uh, Council Member Den, and start with the, 
it's not really a question for the city of Black Diamond, but more asking for your help. Um, the city of Black Diamond has been uh, working at the intersection of 216th and 288th in the Lake Sawyer area. And unfortunately, we have encountered significant delays that have uh, spanned nearly a year. Um, and despite our efforts, we have yet to receive a clear resolution from King County in light of the um, situation. We are seeking your support in helping us move this project along. So we've done the three sides. Uh, we had it all permitted. We've done the work. But then King County came back and said, no, you need to add sidewalks and a few other things. So we're just asking um, that if you can get with Mayor Benson and Andy Williamson, MDART, uh, Economic Director, and see if there's something that you can help us move this project along. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks, uh, Mayor Benson brought that to my attention. We were able to get permitting to get back to the city within a week uh, of, of us interceding. And I understand now the contractor has uh, clearly communicated the changes that the subtle changes that are supposed to be made uh, back to the county. So uh, we'll continue to walk, uh, you know, it, always if you have permitting problems with King County, reach out to me immediately. And then that's what we do. Our job is to help sort of walk or shepherd through the process as best we can. So I think, uh, Department of Local Services and Permitting understand uh, how important that is, and we'll continue to stay on it to make sure that you have clarity and are able to move forward as quickly as, as possible. So thanks. Thanks for, for that. Okay, thank you. Um, Mayor Kelly, Maple Valley. Thank you, uh, Councilman Mordano. I just want to give a big shout out to how much we all appreciate the partnership we have with you and your staff. Uh, Cody's here tonight, and your chief of staff it just means a lot to whenever we reach out to your office, you always get back to us in a timely manner on that. Uh, you touched briefly on the uh, uh, mining pit going on out there in Cumberland and uh, Maple Valley is watching that extremely close. City managers watching it pretty close. We wrote a letter down to King County to watch the review. They're pretty concerned about some reports say like 600 trucks will be coming through town. And we're still trying to figure all that. And that'll be a major disruption to uh, the Maple Valley, especially Maple Valley Highway. So kind of make sure that's on your radar to watch that. And then um, another thing too is really quick, since you already kind of talked about that quite a bit, but also for the sheriff's office, we're focused a lot on getting a lot of deputies, but the 911 center is having a humongous recruitment problem too. So I don't know if that's been on your radar yet or Cody's radar yet. So uh, probably have yeah. a conversation about that because the uh, city manager's got briefed on that about a, about a month or so ago, right, Regan, or somewhere around there. So you said 911 has got a hiring problem? Yeah, they're having a higher, uh, so maybe you can have your staff reach out to the city managers because they just got a briefing on it not too long ago. So Okay, good. I appreciate that heads up on uh, 911. That's important to, fully important to staff. I don't know if you know the statistic. We're at 56% survivability for cardiac arrest in King County. That's the highest in the nation, uh, 56. By contrast, it's 8% in New York City. Isn't that interesting? But yeah, I, I even have a former, uh, one of my staffers is now working over at 911. But yeah, let's get that out. That is a noble profession and an important job. With respect to Cumberland, I hear you, you know, and I, and I remember when the third runway was built and all of these massive infrastructure projects that uh, end up uh, cramming up 169 and Kent Kangley Road and 410 and all of it. So yeah, that is why we want a determination, in my opinion, determination of significance on that project out there so that all of those factors uh, can be considered and then mitigated to the best uh, ability possible. So I'll continue to to fight for you and watch out uh, for that. And, and I know they'll be coming out there at Four Corners and then uh, was the transportation route right through Covington to 18 or is it going to go up Maple Valley Highway? I think it will go up there, but I'll be watching it closely and I'll work with all of your cities and keep you as up to date as I can. I remember we've had a former council member that picketed uh, when all that was going on. So uh She's willing to go right. back out in service and uh, pick it again. <laughs> have them all diverted Picky. to Black Diamond. So. I'm a big fan of picketing as long as it's not in front of my house. Otherwise, it's good to go. <laughs> if you must, you must. And I even <laughs> talked to that council member today, too. I was talking to him. <laughs> it's all good. You oh, very good. All right. Thanks, uh, Sean P. All right. So Mayor, Mayor Wagner. Mayor Wagner, Covington. So, uh, Council Member Dunn, thank you for being here tonight. And thank you for continuing to work with the King County Sheriff's Office 
And I, the main thing I want to bring up is to please continue to work with the sheriff to do communication because Maple Valley and Covington do contract with the King County Sheriff's Office. We're watching the situation very closely and anything you can do to help push that through to resolve any issues so that it doesn't expand. I know that you have to communicate first to get things to happen instead of using the media, but uh, anything you can do to help with that would be greatly appreciated. Anything to help with getting more officers, making it more, <clears throat> whatever is needed to get more officers in here. I know that we're sitting with several open positions and yeah. being able to fill those positions across the county would be very appreciated. Yeah, thanks, Mayor Wagner, for bringing that up. So, I mean, look, King County Sheriff's Office operates because of the economy of scale provided by the contract cities. And if we're contract cities were to leave, it would really dramatically hurt financially the King County Sheriff's Office. And so the partnership is critically important. Um, one of the reasons why I didn't support um, making an appointed sheriff, but rather support an elective sheriff is I think elected sheriff is, is better positioned to feel the pressure of cities and the constituencies out there. That said, uh, we have what we have. And Patty Coltindall is a very competent uh, sheriff and administrator, in my opinion. We don't always agree on things, but uh, she, she, she's been around the county for a while, and I think she knows what she's doing. And you're seeing some of that uh, success in the reduction in vacancy levels. But we've got a long way to go. And I supported a significant increase in re uh, retention uh, or hiring bonuses for new deputies. But I'm thinking maybe we should increase that and, and make it the highest uh, in the state. And just uh, we can we can we have the we have the the 14 billion dollar biennial budget. I think maybe we should just hire our way out of a problem through bonuses and if we can. Anyway. Um, yeah. And then the quality of the communication. Jeff, it's the point's not lost on me. I'm with you. And, and uh, you know, there's another city, Newcastle has some, I think, thoughtful concerns about the sheriff as well. And you might communicate with them a little bit so you're all on the same page. I think there's strength in numbers in negotiating with the sheriff's office so we can get what we want. But uh, the sheriff's deputies, the contract deputies that are working in your cities are really important. They're appreciated. And we just got to make sure that uh, they have the continued support of the leadership, elected leadership and, and appointed leadership in, at the courthouse downtown uh, and also, you know, the financial support so that they can get boots on the ground to do the work. So we'll continue to partner with you and, you know, happy to uh, sit down with you and talk a little bit more about specific concerns when it's appropriate time. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Dunn, for your for joining us tonight and for your continued support for the three cities. You're always uh, there to lend a hand and to uh, help us find that extra money that we need. So thank you. Thanks, Deputy Mayor. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me tonight. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right. It is time for the Joint Council uh, discussion and city updates. So uh, <laughs> Black Diamond is up first. <laughs> uh, so I have a presentation that uh, Mayor Benson uh, put together and she sends her best and sorry she couldn't uh, attend. So we, uh, next slide, please. Oh, I get a handle. Okay, which one is it? Oh, there. Okay, so uh, we already did introductions of the Black Diamond City Council and uh, I will skip to the next. So the Black Diamond Finance, this year the Black Diamond Finance Department has uh, continued their streak of uh, zero audit findings for 16 years, capping off our long tenured finance director's career, May Miller, who retired at the end of 2023. The finance department will continue focusing on increasing internal controls, cost saving opportunities, community engagement, and fiscal stability. Population, the city of Black Diamond has seen a dramatic increase in its population in the last few years due to the master plan uh, development, 10 trails, with the media reporting that Black Diamond is the fastest growing town in King County as of July, 2023, 
An estimated population is between 6,680 and 7,300 at this time. Our fiscal update, the city has a $42.3 million budget for 2024. That includes funding for operations and numerous capital improvement projects. For the past several years, the city has experienced rapid growth. The effects of the growth and the Fed rates effect on the housing industry have large implications within our 2024 budget. Those effects can be uh, seen heavily in our revenues, such as sales tax, investment, interest, and property taxes. There are significant decrease, decreases in recent months, economic challenges ahead that comes with growth, pose an excellent opportunity for us to continue focusing on our goals of increasing internal controls, cost saving opportunities, community engagement, and fiscal stability to ensure a promising future for the residents of Black Diamond. Utility taxes and rates. Beginning in January of 2024, the city began collecting utility tax um, for water and sewer services to Covington and Seuss Creek water districts. This change makes the utility tax code fair amongst all Black Diamond residents and to keep up with the inflation and the cost of growth, City Council resumed the annual lot sewer rate increase that were approved in 2019. With the reinstallation of those increases, the sewer fund will better absorb fiscal shocks and operational demands to weather growing pains. And our Black Diamond Police Department, the Black Diamond Police Department has a staff of 13. So we just got to our 13th uh, police officer, pretty exciting for us. Um, including that's including our police chief and commander. Their current focus now and into the coming years is recruitment and retention, as well as retaining our community police uh, efforts. And then we also have commercial vehicle enforcement, CBE, and Chris Chatterson is our main um, person that does this. He went to class for this. Um, and in 2023, uh, the department performed 172 commercial vehicle inspections, finding 314 offenses and taking 19 vehicles and seven drivers out of service. The department issued 1,639 infractions and 406 warnings. I'll just read a little bit about what Officer Chatterson does. Officers conduct physical inspections of commercial vehicles and their payload for conformity to size, weight, and load restriction. restrictions. Safety and mechanical requirements are determined by state and federal laws, rules, and requirements. They're also responsible for the inspection of the driver records for conformity to license and logbooks. So this is a great program for us, and it also not only makes our city safe, but it also makes the surrounding cities safe as well. Uh, the Black Diamond Police Department is focused on community engagement, and each officer is required to plan a community event to reach this goal, which is pretty cool in our city. In 2023, officers created community events, which included a turkey trot 5K, a donut with a cop, a coffee with a cop, trunk or treat, Labor Day's parade, weekly visits to the community center. In addition, the department conducted classes for women's self-defense, voting education, and recently Stop the Bleed. And our Black Diamond Municipal Court. Current staffing is Judge Krista Swain, Court Administrator is Tanya Parks, Judicial Specialist too is Carly Gartner, and uh, our court second win meets second Wednesdays full day court hearings, Thursday, our third Wednesday half day court, fourth Wednesday full day court hearings, and 24-7 handling of bookings, special set in custody hearings. We also, uh, Judge Swain, we also have a uh, uh, community court, therapeutic court, and Judge Swain will be talking about that later today, tonight. And then planning for our future. Like other cities, staff have been busy working with our consultants, HBL, on the 24 Comprehensive Plan update. And in March 2023, the city did hold a public kickoff event and launched a community survey during the summer, uh, where staff engaged with residents. The Planning Commission has also been very busy reviewing several draft elements of the comprehensive plan over the last several months. And staff are working towards having a first draft document of the comprehensive plan completed by June. And community outreach. Staff from community development, public works, police, and Mountain View Fire participate in local city-sponsored events to meet uh, and greet the community, such as the city also worked in partnership with the local chamber of commerce to support Black Diamond businesses 
as part of our most recent port of Seattle grant funding in 2023 to promote economic development. With those funds, the city also developed a business video to support existing businesses and to promote new businesses in Black Diamond. And I thought you would all like to enjoy watching that video. Here Black here. Diamond is like taking a step back in time. It's that small town community feeling that we all speak about nostalgically. And for those of us who call this home, this is our experience every day. The, the biggest dream for me, for me to, for Evolve to become is uh, the best hangout uh, place in town where we can uh, bring a younger generation where they can feel comfortable enjoying each other's company while drinking beers, wine, and cider. For the love of beer, this was my biggest dream. Hi, we're a propane company that also has a gift shop. Vintage antiques, new and used, and of course, uh, locally made items. Sahara Pizza has been part of Black Diamond for 20 years. We are new owners, but we have the most delicious pizza. We hand make our dough daily, all of our sauces, all fresh locally made ingredients. Our restaurant is remodeled. We are now offering cocktails, beer and wine, a great place to hang out. We have all the TVs for all the local sporting events. People come here because of the small town feel. We love the small town atmosphere and the sense of community. Everyone knows everyone and it's awesome. Well, it just is unique. Coal mining and all of that stuff is just super unique to this area. Come check us out. There's awesome businesses in this area and you won't be disappointed. I love the community of Black Diamond. It's a small town and I come from Hobart, so I have a very small town feel and I like it out here. So you're in our hive. We are local to Black Diamond, Maple Valley. We are a mother and daughter owned business. We do cold pressed juice, vegan goods. We're about 60% locally sourced and we love our community. Our community is very loyal to us. They trust us. Um, and trust our process, all the investigating we do, all the searching out of quality local products. Um, we try to find the best because they deserve the best. Kind of a family, everybody's friends, family, and everybody helps each other out. She says on her business cards that she sells memories. You hear a lot of stories and it's a fun place to be. The community is growing and we have people that have been here for a long time. We have a museum that people can go visit to see the history of Black Diamond. Usually back in, come from Europe, there'd be like one guy and uh, the dad or somebody, he'd come over by himself, work hard in the coal mines here, and then the coal companies would keep them and then they'd send for their families because the coal companies would give them a house and, um, and coal, and that's how our little town grew. Black Diamond is a great place to be a business owner, and as a local community, we support our small businesses. I'm fourth generation Black Diamond, so I wasn't raised here, but I'm back here and doing business, so it's fun to be back in the old hometown. You, you want to come and see Black Diamond, you have to come to our events at 10 Trails. We have a lot of events on the weekends, family friendly, everybody's invited. It brings the community together. Yeah, the retail in uh, 10 Trails is going to be very exciting. Uh, for us, the retail is the third leg of the stool. We have the housing, we have schools and parks, and then the retail, which supports the housing and you know makes it a great place to, to live for people to just be able to walk down the street to the local retailers. We'll have grocery store, bank, daycare, drugstore, all of the daily service needs that people need, along with some local, what I'll characterize as mom and pop shops, nail salons, hair salons, all those local services that people need in their community. Yeah, we do this to create a, a really well-rounded community and a place that people want to live. You want to be able to keep your business with your friends and your neighbors, keep the tax dollars in Black Diamond, and really build a sustainable, thriving community. I would love to have people come to Black Diamond and experience the views, the walking trails, the outdoors. 
We hope that you are going to come and celebrate and spend time here in beautiful Black Diamond, get to know our amazing business community and the people who call this place home. We'd love to have you come and visit us. All right, thank you. Um, more of community outreach. Additionally, staff prepared welcome packets, and we've noticed that um, new businesses coming into town were having, you know, trouble trying to figure out uh, their permitting process. So the city uh, came together and worked on a free 30-minute uh, uh, <laughs> consultation with uh, staff so that people would come in and get that help uh, as going through the process. It's uh, quite daunting if, if you're new you're new and haven't done that before. Uh, museum park improvements and dedication. The city has been partnering with the Port of Seattle since 2020 to enhance the local museum park located in the historic district next to the Black Diamond Museum. Previous grant funding provided for amenities to support our local businesses and restaurants in our historic downtown to activate the outdoor space. Public works and community development staff poured love and labor into beautifying the park with benches, planter boxes, and a new community library that staff got together and built. Um, and it's also our memorial park uh, that was dedicated to Gomer Evans, who you just heard speaking. Um, uh, he passed away last year, but that park is dedicated to him. And we also uh, won uh, the Free Little Library won first place with the Washington State Society Daughters of the American Revolution contest. And that is pictured with Mayor Benson there. Park updates. The city has been working with Grind Line Skate Parks to design and build a new community skate park. This is long overdue. We are excited to say that we will start building this this summer. So we and the children and young adults are excited to see that happen. Park updates. We are also updated, uh, updated the community gym a grant that uh, Council Member Dunn has helped us with. So we have new exterior improvements, including new accessible ramp, new door, new signage with lighting, and interior improvements include new wall padding and window coverings. We also just got a new roof on there. That wasn't with grant money though. <laughs> um, new boat launch. So this just happened uh, finishing uh, this last week. So we have a, a new boat launch at Lake Sur uh, to aid boaters with launching their boats. The dock will be home to the police department's boat, uh, which will allow for faster response to emergencies on the lake. And the police boat portion of the dock will be closed to public access. However, there will be a nice dock for uh, residents and visitors to use. And let's see, trying to get changed here. Yeah. <laughs> Lawson Hills Fire Station. As part of the development agreement for the master plan development, the developer is funding a construction of an additional fire station for the city. The station will be located on the east side of, of the city on Lawson Street and Boss Drive. Construction has begun on the station and is scheduled for completion the first quarter of 2025. And the master plan development update. As of December, 2023, there are 1,191 residential units occupied in 10 trails development. Construction slowed in 2023 due to the increase in interest rates. I know that they just had a celebration with five with the 500th home being sold in there about a month and a half ago. Uh, traffic improvements. Pursuant to the development agreement, the developer is required to improve intersections affected by the master plan development. And the two that we are currently working on is 216th Avenue Southeast and Southeast 288, which you heard me talk to earlier. And SR-169 Roundabout at SR-169 and Roberts Drive. And the 216th and 288th intersection is not yet complete. The city is working with King County to get that done. And the Morgan Street and Roberts Drive plan has been turned in for review and the intersection will have a traffic signal installed. So the fun part is SR-169 Roundabout. Um, so, uh, the start of the first phase in September of 2023, the first phase was the stormwater vault that is now complete except for the park on top. The plans have been submitted and are under review. There was relocation of the Puget Sound Energy gas pipe, and that work took place at night to let some traffic impacts. Currently, Roberts Drive is closed, and that will be closed for uh, roughly six months. 
And during closure, crews will be working on the grade for building the west portion of the roundabout. And the Covington Creek Culvert Replacement Project, this one's coming up to get uh, started. Below the weir on Lake Sawyer are culverts that take the lake's overflow into Covington Creek. Public Works Department has been prepared for funding from King County Flood Control District for up to 2,768,500. This will be used to replace the culverts with a bridge. And then uh, we have permits in, and this construction will begin in 2025. And uh, our springs. Upgrades to the city spring water source are continuing. Construction recently wrapped up on the new pump station, which is increasing water flows from the springs to the city and reconstruction of the city's water transmission main between the pump station and the city's reservoir. Next phase of work included replacement of water main at the spring site and bring the water main across the Green River to the new pump station. Um, anticipated to begin at 25. All this is paid for by the developer. Our community events, Black Diamond takes pride in its history and most of our events celebrate the deep roots of mining and took place in our town in the early 1900s. So uh, we do have Black Diamond uh, Cemetery uh, Memorial Day service. Uh, Black Diamond Miners Day is July 13th. Black Diamond Labor Days is September 1st and 2nd. We have Hometown Christmas. I can't remember the date of that. There you go. And then, uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> and then we also have uh, a community wide garage sale the second weekend in August. And other community ser services and events. The city has many other uh, organizations and uh, events that happen. So we have Tough Mudder. Um, we have Franklin tours at the at the <laughs> museum. We have drop in volleyball. We have Fourth uh, of July at the Lake Sawyer uh, Park or the lake. Um, and then we also welcome Tough Mudder. Any questions? Anybody have any questions? I'm seeing none. So <laughs> hopefully I didn't sound like I talk like an auctioneer. So, <laughs> get that go fast. So, which one of you guys want to go next? It is Covington. Regan. Please. And can we pass the paper down as well? I'll click it for you. Oh, I don't trust that. I wouldn't. There's communication gap there. <clears throat> you still see there? I'm good. good. I'm going to back out of your way. So yeah, you're good. All right. In your bubble. Oh, you can come in my bubble. Uh, it is wonderful to be here with you tonight. This is a great uh, annual event that we hold. Are we ready to roll, Mason? Oh, it looks like it's loading some content there. Excellent. We, uh, can you maximize it? Yeah, we'll get it here. There we go. So we'll start. Tammy talked a lot about growth, and uh, it's it's here in Covington as well, and as well as all the the Tri Cities area. Uh, we've got a couple of new multifamily projects coming in. There'll be about three hundred and thirty units that we're working on, three commercial projects that are happening, some big ones in our uh, light industrial area, uh, two hundred fifty thousand square feet and almost a hundred thousand square feet. We've got twelve subdivisions under review, smaller subdivisions under review right now. And uh, that pipeline should bring um, just about 250 homes in the next four and a half years uh, here into Covington with those uh, subdivisions coming in. And this is loading very slowly. There we go. Try to get fancy and we're too fancy for the internet. Uh, talk a little bit about community development and that's karma there. Uh, we've got 468 building permits that we processed last year just over 3,000 building inspections and about 3,900 business licenses issued. And then Tim, you talked a little bit about uh, helping small businesses there. We have a small business liaison program that we started a couple years ago uh, where small business is not familiar with the permitting process, which can be a real bummer sometimes, uh, comes in and we give them some guidance and show them through, through the process and um, 
that's been a very successful program and helped a lot of our small businesses get going with tenant improvements or whatever permitting they're seeking. Lake Point, as you know, is a, a huge project happening here, here. We do have new owners, Brook Cal and also Toll Brothers. That can be up to 1,750 um, housing units. As we've been working with them and beefing up community development and what we're going to need there, the anticipation is between 2025 and 2029 to have 830 units of um, single family and townhomes uh, built in that property. So that's only four and a half years away to bring, if you add on to those other subdivisions, over a thousand new housing units here in Covington. So a lot happening, a lot, uh, it's gonna move fast. So it, they can also have up to 1.3 million uh, square feet of commercial space. Uh, they do not yet have a commercial developer uh, as a partner on that project. So that's something they're working on getting, and then uh, we'll start moving with that. But the approach has to be, what's that? So don't hire them. Okay, <laughs> good heads up. <laughs> Let's make note of that. Uh, but our, our approach as we worked in the development agreement is it has to be a balanced development approach. So they can't put in all residential or all commercial. They've got to do it simultaneously. So uh, that's that's how you'll see that area develop. Our SR uh, 516 project here in Kent Kingley, you may have had to drive through that. Uh, anyway, that's uh, that should be completed this year. You're welcome. So it, it'll be good. It'll widen it to five lanes. It'll give us um, a walkway under the bridge there over Jenkins Creek that will eventually have a trail connection from Founders Park up to Jenkins Creek Park. So we're excited about that. And we will continue to push the widening of Kent Kingley East to Maple Valley. And then it will be your problem. <laughs> so we're kind of excited about that. <laughs> Sean, I'm looking at you and you're looking at Laura. <laughs> We just set the policy vision and the budget. There you go. <laughs> but uh, no, it's it's a needed project. We're grateful to be able to have that done pretty soon. I just mentioned Founders Park. Uh, that was previously called SoCo Park, but we did a community outreach uh, naming uh, kind of initiative there. And the council, after a lot of input was given, selected Founders Park. It's a downtown neighborhood park there right across the street from where our future town center will be on Wax Road. Uh, it's uh, almost, our first phase is almost complete. It's got a trail, ADA parking, gathering area, and, and open lawn. Some future phases will be a play area, amphitheater, and some other connections and, and picnic areas and stuff like that. So it'll be a nice downtown park for the community. Jenkins Creek Park, which that trail will connect from Founders up through the uh, Kent Kangley Construction Project to Jenkins Creek Park. That's a great park, beautiful. If you haven't been back there, it's a nice little oasis to escape to, but just uh, not a great uh, access to it. So we purchased just about two acres to help create that. We had a groundbreaking ceremony a month or so ago and construction is beginning right away. And so hopefully we'll have that uh, completed by the end of the year. Knock on wood. I think everybody's familiar with our aquatic center uh, that we have, and it is uh, at about the end of its useful life. So we have been for the last couple of years doing a lot of work to prepare for a new aquatic center slash community center and recreation center uh, that we're pretty excited about. We've got the feasibility stun, uh, study done, uh, several different design concepts were presented to the city council. They chose this one. It's approximately uh, 80,000 square feet with a cost estimate of $98 million. So we will we will have a donation plate yeah. back there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, for this. We're hoping to get some seed money tonight. <clears throat> but anyway, it's going to be a wonderful, this is just not a uh, Covington project. Uh, you'll see a little bit later how many people we have using our, our current aquatic center. And this is just going to increase that so this is really a regional Southeast King County Community Center. <clears throat> and we're really excited about it. Uh, now we just need to work on the funding of it. Public safety is our city council's top priority. Uh, without that, not much else can happen here. or Things fall apart. We've been working really strongly with SEPTED, crime prevention through environmental design. Uh, our, most of our officers are trained on this. Most of our city planners are trained on SEPTED principles. Christina's trained on SEPTED. She went to the training as well. Um, and the property owners that have gotten involved with this have seen a decrease in crime on their properties. 
Uh, our officers are always available to go out to a property, uh, our commercial properties, and they'll do an assessment or a, a SEPTED audit and provide uh, feedback for them. I think we just did Walmart a couple weeks ago. Walmart reached out to us and we provided a lot of good uh, feedback and input for them. But paying for public safety, as we all know, is incredibly expensive. Our costs keep rising uh, too fast. So our city council passed a business and occupation tax that will go into effect July 1st. It's a two tenths of 1% across all the categories of, of gross receipts. Uh, the council did set the threshold at 250,000. So that means if your business makes under 250,000, you will not pay the business and occupation tax, which means about 177 businesses will be contributing to it. It's pretty hard to forecast exactly what the revenue is going to be coming in. So we put it just over a million dollars. It will come in more than that because it's impossible to forecast what we'll get from the hospitals and a lot of the medical services. So it will be higher than that. And it is 100% dedicated to public safety. So business to business, uh, this is something started by CETUS. That's the Covington Economic Development Council. Five members of that council are appointed from the chamber board of directors and five from the city council. Uh, we started uh, B2B, business to business. Uh, you can see this, this map on the bottom left there. We've split the, the city up into 10 different zones, our commercial zones. And each member of CETUS, uh, two to three to four times a year, walks those zones and visits each business um, in that area. We started that at the beginning of last year, and we've had a lot of really wonderful opportunities to hear from the businesses and what they need. And it's really just us going saying, what do you need? How are things? How can the city help? Um, my zone is zone seven. I have Ulta and I always come out smelling a little better um, <laughs> after visiting there. So, so that's good. But it's a wonderful thing. We developed the See, Say, Do Covington Pledge. We want that to be a little catchy, but if you see something, say something and do something about it. It's all to keep our community clean, safe and welcome. So uh, a lot of great uh, work going on there with CETUS. You can see that postcard we put together. We've provided that to all of our businesses. Because sometimes they're like, well, how, what, how do I report this crime or that crime or this? So that's a diagram exactly what to do with which crime and, um, and how to report it and where to go to report it. We do have a proposed ballot measure that the city council has passed to be on the August primary ballot. This is a two tenths of a percent sales tax increase to fund street maintenance. Um, this is, well, I can't get into too much about um, uh, what I was gonna say, but I'll go with this. So <laughs> the council, right now we have a $20 car tab fee and the council decided that if this tax is passed, um, they will not collect anything until that car tab fee is repealed. So right now we collect about $350,000 a year with the car tab. It doesn't do a lot for our streets. This tax would bring in $1.3 million. So uh, there's a huge benefit there, but also for Covington residents, it means that they're not footing the bill for the entire street maintenance fund. Uh, anybody coming to Covington and shopping here, so keep coming, uh, will help pay for our street maintenance. So we'll see how that goes. We're doing a lot of, um, education on that and getting it around the community and that's on the August primary ballot. I want to bring up a little bit about Covington's clean team. Last year we hired uh, one person, Jennifer, and she she formed our, our the Covington clean team. And from there it's just really exploded and been a really wonderful, great thing. Um, our adopt a street program has more than doubled with uh, organizations and groups that have, uh, we've had to keep creating new routes. We started a program just a couple of months ago called Random Acts of Cleanup. And what this is, is anybody can just sign up for this and they can come in, get a vest, get some garbage bags. One of the, what do you call those pickers? We'll call it a picker. Yeah, yeah. you guys know what I'm talking about. Yeah, uh, get one of those and just start cleaning up and just clean up the community. It's been, we've got uh, over 30 volunteers doing that. We started a little thing internally. We call it Zen with Jen, uh, where if you need a 15, 30 minute break, you, we walk around and pick up garbage together. So a lot of fun. In fact, Krista was out doing it today, huh, Krista? 
So it's a lot of great um, opportunity to clean up our, our downtown area. And it's exciting to see what's happening there. City council outreach, this is something that is vital for our city council and something they continue to push is we wanna be out there. We wanna be out with the people. So uh, we created two city council service projects each year. Uh, that's one from just a couple of weeks ago, that, that bottom picture. We've got what seems like a mayor's meetup every week, but I know it's not that often. <laughs> Uh, where, where Jeff will meet with the community, one or two council members joins him on those, um, get a lot of great feedback. We've got Mayor's Day of Concern, the Make a Difference Day, and National Night Out. And then we have one or two council members attending, I think, just about every HOA annual board meeting that is held in Covington. So I know you, I know the city council gets a lot of invites uh, for those. So thank you for attending those. It's a lot of great outreach that's being provided. We can't not talk about our Covenant Youth Council. They're just an amazing group of, of youth and we're grateful for the work they do. Uh, they're involved in a lot of different service projects as well. They go down to Olympia for the Youth City Action Days. They participate in legislative mock legislative sessions, meet with all of our legislators, and it's a great experience for them. Uh, they, they answer letters to Santa, like people are writing little kids and they answer them all and it's really great. We love that youth council. <clears throat> uh, so many of you will probably remember, uh, Covington has a sister city, Tatsuno, Japan. And prior to COVID, we did a student exchange every year where they'd send 10 students over and we host them, have a great time. That ended uh, during COVID, but this year it will be, uh, it, we're picking that back up again. So in August, we'll have our Tatsuno students come and, and visit Covington. So we're excited for that. That picture is a Maybe a month ago or so, uh, there's a Japanese exchange program through the Kent School District as well that we participate in. And uh, they always like to come in and see Jeff. <laughs> so that's fun. Ready, Set, Play is our awesome program we've got going on every summer. I think we started this in 2016. Uh, it's now a wonderful uh, partnership with the Chamber. It gets our kids active during the summer. And they go out, There's we have these little brag badges and a business, so last year we had 24 businesses, sponsors each one of those badges, and each one is associated with an activity. So a hike or riding your bike, baking cookies, serving someone, brushing your teeth, whatever it is. And once you do that activity, then you go into that place of business that sponsored, sponsored that badge and pick it up. And if you complete all of them, so uh, the 24, then you get the, the complete prize pack at the end, which is gift cards from a lot of businesses, a swim pass to the aquatic center, uh, so we had 179 kids last year complete that. And the thing we hear from the parents is thank you for scheduling our summer for us. Uh, so, <clears throat> so that's been a lot of fun. And sometimes hard to do, right, Jennifer? It's yeah. hard to get out and do all that stuff. Yeah. So uh, athletics, recreation, aquatics, been a, another really busy year. You can see um, the participation in each of our leagues and camps and whatnot. And, and we continue to uh, have wait lists in all of our programs, especially at the Aquatic Center. It's tough to get in there. And you can see uh, just over 132,000 in-water visits last year at our Aquatic Center, which is uh, pretty amazing. Our student art show, it actually just ended recently, but um, this was done by our Covington Youth Council. This uh, Last year, they organized that. They had eight different students from eight different schools in Covington draw their art. They got 10 businesses to display it and then listed those businesses out and you could go around the community and see the 592 pieces of artwork that our students drew and, and hung up during that art show. So that's always a fun one that the students really love to participate in. And then of course our community festivals and events, we had a lot of uh, summer concerts and movies in the park that are always a lot of fun up at the amphitheater at, at Covington Community Park. And our annual festivals, and we had just over 14,000 attendees at, um, throughout those, those couple of months at those events, and, and we'll continue to do those. Next, communications and outreach. Uh, that's a, you know, the greatest story never told what people think is what municipal governments do. Despite every effort we can make to get the word out, uh, it can be really hard sometimes, but... This is good news, almost 500,000 page views on our, on our um, website, uh, nearing 13,000 followers on Facebook and uh, some of our other programs. Our Covington Connects is, a, is an app you can use to report any problems or issues you see around town. So you can see uh, just over almost 1,400 reports last year. Um, 
our maintenance uh, people and the people that have to respond to that weren't real happy when we got Covington Connects because uh, it skyrocketed the amount of requests we got, but it's been a great thing now that we've uh, learned to manage it well. I want to talk a little bit about the state of the city. Before the pandemic, we used to do an in-person thing and that was nice. And then during the pandemic, we started making videos and we continue to do that. So last year we had a 16 minute video and on YouTube, we had 124 views. And on Facebook, we had 378. And I said, well, how many people watched the whole thing? We got 42 people that watched over one minute of our state of the city last. I laughed too. Yeah, our state of the city last year. So I said, well, enough of that. Uh, people have very short attention spans. So this year, we declared May as the state of city month. And we created 17 short videos with all the council members and myself. And it's been a, a wonderful thing. In fact, two hours ago, I, I looked up, we now have 7,874 views on those videos. Not all of them are posted yet, but on the videos that have been posted. And those numbers from last year are like after it been out for a whole year. So, so anyway, uh, what we've learned is people have very short attention spans. So I should wrap this up uh, real quick here. But uh, any questions anybody has, I would be happy to take. Yeah. Yeah, Mayor Kelly. Your uh, community claim team. Yeah. That's a pretty cool program. Do they ever emphasis on shopping carts by chance? That's part of what Jennifer does. So every day, if, if you're in, in Covington or downtown, you'll see her. She's out every day picking up garbage and collecting shopping carts. In fact, we're, we're actually, we'll be bringing a shopping cart ordinance to the council pretty soon to where um, businesses will have to pay a fee to get them back or help collect them on their own too. And then um, I really like the council outreach program. That's pretty cool. You guys are doing that. So discussion we have in the future. And then I really like the arch thing you guys had in here. That's pretty the impressive. The student art show? Yeah. Yeah. I was just kind of, you know, curious which one uh, Mayor Pro Tem uh, Smith was, but I'll look at the Pinterest. <laughs> outside, so. He won the contest. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, but that's pretty, uh, art's really important. So yeah. It's important. We all recognize that. So just thank you. And I think Deputy Mayor Parnell has a question if you don't mind, Madam Chair. No, okay. So yeah. you mentioned the Covington Connects is an app that you're using. Did that replace C Click Fix or is that a rebranding of it? Uh, no, we've always called it Covington Connects. It's it's simultaneous. It C Click Fix is the company. Okay. Uh, it's branded as Covington That's Connects. Okay. Yeah. Because I've seen you guys have a ton of use of that. I thought, but if you have that and the. No, oh, just that one. Cool. Yeah. That's cool. Mayor Kelly. When's uh, 204 going to connect to Highway 18? What's the timeline on that, you think? Probably end of next year. I, I hesitate giving timelines on, on public infrastructure projects, but that's the hope at end of next year. Just a quick one. What's the population of Covington right now? I don't remember I see it on the slides. Right we're at 22, just over 22,000. I think we're our 2023 numbers. Thank you. Yep. All right. Any other questions? Just one more. Yeah. So you, just 15 seconds on your youth council. You mentioned it, but yeah. I don't know anything about it. Yeah, so um, the the city council a couple uh, several years ago, the a goal was to engage our children and youth, and so uh, that's why we created Ready Set Play to engage our children, and the youth was through the youth council. So they can have uh, there's 15 seats on the youth council. They meet monthly. We have a staff liaison, and two adult mentors that work with them. Uh, a lot of what they do is working. They do work with a lot of our other city commissions. Uh, to give input and involvement in what they're doing. And um, it's a great program. And so it's yeah. youth-led. Yeah. So totally youth-led. Totally youth yep. Changes every year, conference and stuff. Yeah. And they decide what yeah. There's an application uh, they submit, and they come get interviewed by the council and, and appointed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Oh, Christiana. Thank you. Yeah. So also, I'm, a, I'm actually interested in how you restarted your Sister Cities program, um, since I would be curious about us doing that in our city. Too. Yeah. So we just kept in touch with them. Um, the, the, the government structure in Japan is a little bit different. The government can actually pay to send their students here for sister, sister city type programs. Washington state does not allow that. So we have not sent students there, but they send them here every year. So during the pandemic, we just kept in touch with them. We communicate a couple times a year. And so we reached out at the beginning of this year again to say, hey, do we wanna go ahead and do it? Last year they were going to try, but they couldn't get it to work. But uh, so we just kept it up. But another thing we did before the pandemic 
is they also uh, did video chats with uh, elementary school kids at Covington Elementary School. So we'll get we'll start work on that again too. So that was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yep. All right. Seeing no one. Okay. okay. Thank, you, Thank you very much. All right. Uh, Maple Valley's up for Phil Pot. Thank you. Um, so similar to Black Diamond, we have a, a lovely photo of our council, but you've done introductions already. I did want to share that over uh, in 2023, our council revised, updated our vision, mission, and core values. And it's been our guiding star as we look at future programs and projects within the city. Um, our city staff, uh, we have 57 full-time staff, 17 part-time but that's augmented by up to 60 people in the summer to make our, our parks and recreation programs work, our swim beach, our day camp. So uh, our streets maintenance, we couldn't do it without all that additional summer help. Um, and then as has been mentioned before, we do contract with King County for the sheriff's office. There's 20 officers when fully staffed. We have three vacancies right now. And then one, um, uh, city staff who also works in the police department to help support them. Uh, legislative priorities this year, our, our council did a lot of great work down in Olympia. They went down looking for funding for the King County Sheriff's Office helicopter, wanted some more work done in the police pursuit, um, asking for a study at the minimum, looking for some transportation funding, mental health service funding and permanent message board funding. I'll talk about the permanent message board later but I just wanna share how successful they were. The King County Sheriff's Office is purchasing a new helicopter this year. The pursuit laws were updated. We um, helped maintain the SR18 funding and secured funding $5 million for a pedestrian bridge over 169. Uh, the city was awarded $200,000 towards community mental health programming and $200,000 for a new permanent message board. You know, Regan mentioned how difficult it is to communicate with the public and without a newspaper, and not everybody's on social media. So we found that message boards are a great way to communicate. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanna share a few of the major accomplishments from 2023. I'll just highlight a couple. Uh, we did pass a levy lid lift that's dedicated to public safety. And it was just um, really amazing. We had a 66% yes vote from the community, which really showed a lot of confidence in our public safety and in the city. So I think that was great. We added code compliance officer and updated all of our codes. And then we also added a generator at city hall, which was huge for uh, resilience for government. Uh, other major accomplishments, the Whitty Road roundabout, we're currently on punch list items. So it's nearing the end. Uh, council adopted brand new downtown standards and our community resource coordinator, which you'll hear from later tonight, uh, it's a, an amazing program where we partner with the Tahoma School District and provide different um, mental health programming to the community and to the uh, students within the Tahoma School District. Some of the things included fentanyl and suicide prevention events. And then we do an annual community-wide Kindness Connects campaign that continues to just be really embraced and enjoyed by the community. Uh, other major accomplishments from last year, we're really proud that we gave uh, $475,000 in ARPA funding to human services and nonprofit grants for 2023 and $473,000 to small businesses. So it's really exciting that in 2023, that those funds are continuing to go out to businesses and nonprofits. Um, also wanted to highlight that our Parks and Rec program had a record year in youth basketball with 803 um, participants in our youth basketball program. Um, so our we have an economic development commission that has been working extremely hard. So um, I just wanna share some of the stats kind of were on other slides, but you all have one of these in front of you. It gives all kinds of fun stats about what happened in 2023 for Maple Valley. But I also wanted to share that our Economic Development Commission has launched a pitch and pivot and has worked with a number of startup or, or small businesses looking to grow or change uh, direction. Uh, it's called pitch and pivot. 
Um, this is a, a picture from one of the, the responses from one of the businesses in town who used that program. Um, it's great. We bring in uh, professionals from that industry or whatever area that they're looking to grow, bring in city staff, um, and it's been very well received. Um, we also launched a new um, separate uh, page for our Economic Development Commission, um, really as we're trying to market out to new businesses. Um, and we gave it a really simple uh, <clears throat> website, which is gomaplevalley.com, and it links straight to the city website to the economic development page where you can find out more information about how to um, start businesses within the community and, and different uh, resources available. And then we also got a name for our gnome. <laughs> so our new city mascot is Norm the Gnome. So kind of a big deal. <laughs> uh, we also created um, a video with the Dennis Quaid project, so I'll share this video quickly. So Maple Valley was this coal mining, this whole area, there, there was a lot of history here. People from Seattle and some of the larger areas, wealthy families would come here to get away. Actually it was, we have three lakes in Maple Valley, so people would come and, and enjoy it as a, as a getaway. And then you fast forward a number of years, it started to develop. People started to really realize that this was a great place to live, a great place to be close to the large metropolitan, but also feel like you're um, away. And we became a city in 1997. At that time, there was 9,000 residents. Fast forward to 2023, we are now nearly 30,000 residents. Yeah, we really find Maple Valley is kind of the perfect fit where we're close enough to all the amenities and other businesses and resources that we need, but also close enough to nature and the, really kind of the true talent, um, being able to work where we live uh, has been a perfect balance for us. So this area is definitely a kind of a pocket between nature and the mountains and also the city life. Uh, it allows you to kind of be here, have your own like kind of pace of life and style, but also with easy access to everything else that you need uh, or would want in some of those bigger city amenities. Uh, I think the people here generally appreciate that and they respect nature. They kind of, you know, that kind of resonates in, uh, throughout the community. Yeah, people feel safe. Maple Valley has been ranked in the top 15 safest cities in numerous years in a row. We have a really strong economic development committee that really likes to dive in and get involved with our future growth and our current growth. We want to make sure even our current businesses still feel like they're part of the process and they're involved in town. Maple Valley is a great place to raise a family and it starts with uh, we have an amazing school district and I think that's very important. Uh, but we also have an amazing park network and it's not just Maple Valley's parks within our city limits, which is amazing. We have um, a beautiful lake with a gorgeous park that's connected to regional trails. And those regional trails um, can connect you to all over the county, really. So it's a, it's a way to have some non-motorized connection. You know, Economic Development Commission is something that basically serves and supports the uh, Maple Valley City Council. Uh, and really just helps give a business voice to the city as they're trying to um, really kind of plan with intentionality where we're heading and where we're going um, to make sure they're getting that input from businesses. Well, we have robotics which is going off, going off to the national competition here. We have We the People. The sports teams win state sports continuously throughout the year. The drama play just got permission from Disney to use one of their plays will be one of the Disney's plays. So there's always something going on in the performing arts uh, section there. The band is one of the largest in the state with over 160 some students involved in that. You are close enough to your elected officials and your city officials to have those conversations, to have somebody talk to you, to talk about needs or concerns and changes happen from citizens actually voicing their concerns. And I think that engagement, because they, they see that they can make a difference, they're more engaged. I'm really excited about being in this community and watching our kids grow up. Uh, it's a place where we feel safe. We know that they're going to have you know, good quality friends, educators that are going to basically speak wisdom and uh, truth into their lives. Um, but this is also a place where they can get all sorts of experience. Uh, they can learn, grow, develop, and can really grow into great people um, that hopefully contribute to their community just like those around them are doing. Maple Valley, Washington, a natural fit. For more, 
visit maplevalleywa.gov. So yeah, that was a, a fun project and has been well received. Um, you know, what's on the horizon for Maple Valley? Well, in our public safety, you'll hear from our chief with the other chiefs tonight. Um, but one of the things we've been working on is uh, similar to Covington is our retail outreach and you're know, working on that theft mitigation. And we've just had a, um, a great um, response and some really great meetings uh, with the business community, really talking about ways they can prevent our officers go out to the businesses. Chief's going to tell you a little bit more about it. We also, um, uh, you know, post COVID, there's been this, you know, how can we rebuild our Explorer program? Well, when I say that, we still, we, our Explorer program in Maple Valley had over 4,500 hours um, of service in 2023. I think we're the most active post in King County. So it's something that that we celebrate and is it's just such an awesome uh, program. So. Um, as far as transportation on the horizon, we'll, we have the punch list items to finish up on Whitty Road. Uh, we also have um, some culverts that we need to replace on Whitty Road, which I only bring up because we're gonna close the road for about a week <laughs> this summer. So that'll be a, a big deal. But I also mentioned that we received funding for a pedestrian bridge um, over 169 and we're beginning the design on that so that it's going to be a great connection uh for kind of where rock creek elementary over to where our farmers market is uh we also are working on a new crosswalk near the tahoma high school on kent kangley as well as some other safety improvements around the community um and then once um on 169 also in front of the legacy site we have a very major project this uh this uh, summer starting and um, you'll see a couple of roundabouts, expansions. So if you're coming to the farmer's market, just have a little patience as that construction project starts up. Um, we're working on the comprehensive plan like many other cities in King County. Um, and we uh, it's been completely handed off to the city council. We were actually the first city to submit ours to King County. So that was um, exciting. Yes, we're all, we're all. And, um, uh, so King, our council is currently reviewing the comprehensive plan right now. Um, communications and marketing. Again, it's just a tough area to always make sure that you're communicating and connecting with our community. Um, you see the ice, ice baby. It's kind of a joke, but we did that during uh, our crews did that during one of our um, major snowstorms. We have started to use those portable message boards as the way to communicate because if it, we get more attendance at our events and more um, engagement when we use those, which is what drove the idea of doing permanent message boards at entryways to the community. So we're excited about that funding, excited about that project. And then also we'll be launching a brand new website this year. So that's gonna help with some of our connections too. Um, expected development that's in the queue right now, uh, Villages, it's on 169 across from Les Schwab area. And we're expecting about 216 multifamily units, um, Chick-fil-A. So you're gonna lose a few shoppers in Covington. Um, and, uh, uh, some other businesses in there. And then over by QFC, we're expecting an 85 multifamily unit there as well. Uh, we have amazing events in um, in Maple Valley. We uh, hosted a brand new one this year called Find Your Fit Volunteer and Service Expo. And we had a huge, uh, huge turnout. Um, but we're also replacing a playground, playground, um, working on Henry Switch property, which is uh, looking for a future pump track. Just a lot of great things going on. Um, the events uh, are coming up. Um, they started with a fishing derby earlier this uh, in April, and then it just goes from there. We have uh, Maple Valley Days on the June 7th through 9th, and then the bike challenge, and then we go to music in the park and all kinds of fun events. Um, within the community. And you can see on our stat page, the number of attendees that we get each year. A huge project that we're working on is at our Lake Wilderness Golf Course. We are designing a new community clubhouse. Um, so here's some uh, images of what that um, it's proposed to look like. We're really excited. If any of you have been to our the clubhouse currently at the Lake Wilderness um, Golf Course, it's been there for quite a while. The carpet, I think, is the same as it was there in 1965. So uh, <clears throat> it's could tell some stories, I'm sure. Um, so we're really excited. And part of it, we're looking at 
um, potentially adding event space that would host up to 250 people. There's a lot of events that leave Maple Valley, uh, galas and auctions and things. It would be nice to pull those back in and have those have space available within our community. Um, we anticipate the construction documents being done this year and going out to bid early next year. So opening in 2026. Really exciting. And then just as we wrap up our ARPA fundings uh, from the uh, from the federal government, just want to highlight that the, the category where Maple Valley spent the majority of the funding is really for grants. So I talked about what we spent in 2023 in an earlier slide, but overall from 21 through 24, we've spent um, 1.3 million in nonprofit grants and seven over $720,000 to small businesses within our community, which is something to really be celebrated. Uh, we're working on our biennial budget, the community others. Um, council had their budget retreat yesterday, so uh, they've been already diving in, working hard. And we'll have that adopted by the end of the year. And with that, I'll answer any questions. Any questions? Uh, an audience council question? No, nope, sorry. Not open public. Nope. <laughs> sorry, Mr. Dean. <laughs> um, anybody? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about the volunteer and service expo. So how? How would that be coordinated? You know, people sign up to do various events for the city and you have someone on staff that coordinates and keeps track of hours and, you know. So actually that was a, we called it kind of uh, find your fit volunteer expo and Councillor Pearson uh, worked with one of uh, with, with our parks department staff and they put on this, uh, we put on this event that um, we invited nonprofits because we've been hearing over and over from nonprofits saying, we can't get volunteers. And then we hear from our residents saying, where do I volunteer? So Councilor Pearson had this idea of finding this, how do we bring everybody together? And so created this event where we invited our nonprofit partners to come in with tables, booths, and, and sign up sheets. And then residents came in and connected. And each one of those nonprofits walked away with a long list of new volunteers. I think um, Mark Persley was in the crowd. I don't know if he's still here from our community center, but he ended up with a really long list. Um, and I, I would say there was over 100, 150 people that walked through that night. And the 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 connections and the relationships, not just between the residents and the nonprofits, but between the nonprofits amongst each other was amazing. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. I'll piggyback on that really quick. Councilor Pearson, how many booths do you have about that thing? And um, how many? We had um, we had somewhere like twenty four organizations, and we had to actually wait list folks because we just didn't have enough space for the first time. We we are planning on expanding that, but we actually had wait lists of organizations. Um, and did you geographically limit? I mean, it, like, did you have organizations coming as far as Seattle, or did you say you have to be within 15 miles? So because it was our first event, our thought was that it would just serve Maple City of Maple Valley, that area, and also the Tohoma School District. And and like I said, it was so many people that were right. wanting to participate that we, um, you know, nonprofit service organizations, um, Maple Valley Food Bank, um, bike rescue. I mean, it was just yeah, some, some ones that you would think of and the, some ones that some of the organizations that wouldn't really come to head right away. But what's interesting, something that that was really cool, uh, the unintended consequence of just doing it is we wanted to connect organizations to people. But while the organizations were there, they were connecting with one another, which we hadn't really completely thought about. But that was just really cool that Here's Foster Champs connecting with other organizations like Backpack Buddies and, and, and so yeah, on. So, that's yeah. awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, Councilor. Uh, I'm a Councilor. Yeah. Uh, City Manager Philbot, can you tell our sister cities a tool we use quite a bit when we're coordinating future events and current events, how we track people by using the cell phone data thing, whatever yes. it's called? Yeah, so we've contracted with a, a group called Placer. And so a lot of our stats you have on here is actually from cell phone data that's tracked. And so we can go in and put a, a, a specific date, a specific border of location, and they can tell us uh, how many cell phones, so they can predict how many people have gone into that space and they can tell where it's coming from. So we can say like, um, 
the Maple Valley Farmers Market on Saturday had X number of people show up and they're coming from this zip code and that zip code. Um, so we're that data has been very helpful as for our Economic Development Commission and for council as they look at the value add of different events. All right, any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Can I make a recommendation? Can we give all three of those presenters a rapid one o'clock? Hours and hours making those PowerPoints. It's very impressive. So, and I keep these for a year to so see you know, so when I get asked about Black Diamond, I pull it out of the back. <laughs> oh, this was one Black Diamond. She even signed it for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, our next topic is public safety. So, our three uh, police chiefs will come up and talk about what's happening in each of our cities. Uh, hi, my name is Chief Easterbrook. I'm with uh, the Covington Police. Uh, we will get to everyone else here in a minute. But let's get started here real quick. Uh, first thing I want to dive into is the coordinated efforts we made. Uh, that was something that was requested in the last meeting. Uh, and so we have done some uh, coordinated efforts. Uh, the first one, we've done some detective coordination where we are using our detectives from each of the cities to address problems that are uh, plaguing all of us. So um, we will have a lot more on that as we kind of work on some new plans to deal with uh, organized retail theft, drugs, things of that nature. So uh, we'll keep working on that. Uh, second is, uh, I know a request was for DUI emphasis. We've been doing uh, click it or ticket, all the traffic emphasis we can get our hands on where there's grant money available. Uh, I know our officers probably done 150 hours and I know the other Departments have done something similar, so that's been very effective in helping with some of the traffic problems. We still have a lot to go, but I will keep working on those. And lastly, a shop with a cop, which is a great uh, community event where we have kids uh, that uh, basically need a Santa Claus. Uh, the Covington and Maple Valley Rotaries step in, provide funds, and we get to take the kids around, pick out some gifts for them to have for Christmas. So uh, that ends up being a great event for all of us to participate. And I'll turn it over to uh, Commander Martinez. Make me go for it, let's see how it is. Yep. Okay, talking about the business outreach, you know, for the city of Black Diamond, especially for the police department, our mission and value is always to make a positive impact in our community through positive connections and, and, and contacts. Uh, our mission is always to go out there and maintain and to gain the, the public trust. And we do that through, you know, stopping into businesses. Uh, if there was an expectation for our officers, especially our day shift officers to go in talk to the business owners, talk to the employees of, of the businesses within our city and make connections and also have a, a presence there. Um, one of the big things we found out, and I'm sure there's a lot of people in this room that kind of feel that way, is that they're afraid to call 911 for whatever reason. Um, they think that maybe the problem that they're facing isn't big enough to call 911. Um, and what we're finding is that we're, we're in the businesses making these contacts, they're like, oh yeah, we had the suspicious car, we had a suspicious person that was you know, lingering in our parking lot, but we failed to call. And come to find out after doing a little bit of an investigation, they were involved in a burglary, you know, nearby. Um, so giving them a year uh, and, and really just being present and, and hearing the problems within our community has really helped us um, solve problems. And we all know that um, solving crime isn't just a one-sided event. Uh, it involves the community as well. Uh, so in making those positive uh, contacts and partnering with our community to solve crime um, is one of the foundations that we have for our police department. Um, so uh, we, we, you know, we're not, unfortunately, the, the safest cities, we're not a, a one of the safest cities because our population isn't uh, big enough, but I'm sure if it was, um, we would be one of the safest cities in, in Washington, uh, just because of the proactive enforcement that we do have. Um, and it's really based on the number of calls that we do have. Uh, it, we're not a Covington, we're not a Maple Valley, we're, you know, they're going call to call. Uh, we don't have that call volume. Although our call volume from last year to this point uh, this year is already up 52%. So we are getting busier. Uh, we are trying to, 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 to be out there and still have our presence. Uh, you look on Facebook and you see uh, black, guy, black diamond officers. Uh, we have that stigma that, you know, we stop every car that goes one mile per hour over. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm sure that's true. <laughs> uh, I could tell you that is not a fact. <laughs> I've, I've done plenty of studies on that. Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's one and a half. No, it's not. Um, but it's really, you know, when we talk about the traffic stops that we do do, 
uh, is to deterring crime within our community. It's making contact. It's not always enforcement. It's there's a lot of education involved in that and making sure that people understand the laws and uh, you know pertaining to traffic from the within our uh, city. Um, and again, you know, just going back to talking about providing opportunities for open communication, uh, being a presence and and being accessible to our community is, is super important. Not hiding in our cars, not hiding in uh, in the office. You know, I, I think being out there, being visible, and being accessible is, is one of the foundations of being a good police department. So, that I think I'm next. We have to play. Oh, yeah, yeah. sweet. All right, needs some OJT. I got you. I, got you. I appreciate it. Okay, so I'm uh, Chief Collins, the Maple Police Department, for those who know me. Uh, City Manager uh, Phil Pott talked uh, briefly about this. So um, I'm not one to read bullet points on a, power, on a uh, PowerPoint to folks y'all could read. But what I wanted to touch on was about a year ago, uh, coming out of the pandemic, uh, all of us nationwide had problems with property crime. Property crime had increased from the pandemic up through the next fall, following couple of years. Um, about early 2023, we started seeing a drop in our retail uh, theft uh, with the city of Maple Valley. So I think, hey, success, I got 33% drop, right? Well, I started talking to uh, some of the folks that actually are involved in our uh, commercial business district in Maple Valley, and they were not having the same numbers as what I was seeing. So we started doing some digging, and what we found was is that there was some misconceptions about there about how to report. There was some misunderstandings about how to report crime. Um, there was some misconceptions about consequences, misconceptions about uh, actually holding folks accountable. So what we decided to do is we uh, had a uh, our first business forum uh, roughly about nine months ago. Uh, we invited uh, most of the leaders, managers from a lot of our business community within the city of Maple Valley along with myself, uh, my administrative sergeant, uh, our city manager was there and our prosecutor was there. And what it was, was basically instead of me sitting up here and, and, and preaching about uh, calling 911 and reporting crime, we sat there and listened and said, well, what, what's y'all's challenge? What, 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 are you, what are your expectations of us? And then I can tell you what we need from y'all. Uh, that was probably in my 25 year career, the most beneficial uh, one hour that I've had dealing with business community uh, ever. Uh, what we've done over the last years after having those talks and telling us that we do hold people accountable, we will arrest folks for shoplifting, that you do need to call us, that, you know, there's certain things that tie our hands if you don't want to be a victim of crime. We put all that information out. And by doing that, we've been able to have some successes with uh, the business community. And yes, my stats for uh, retail theft went up over the last year. And probably the only chief in America says yes that I wanted that because they were getting underreported. So um, we'll continue to do this. We have this set as a quarterly meeting to go with the business community and us sitting down and discussing what the what the successes we're having and what challenges we're still having. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing where we go from here. Okay, in Covington, uh, we've obviously, as Regan pointed out, done a lot with SEPTED. Uh, we've been working very closely with community development to push that out to the businesses. Um, we, we do have the ability to put a police officer out to do an assessment. Uh, we did one for Walmart. Uh, hopefully, we'll see the results of that here uh, very shortly. Um, next thing is for organized retail theft. Uh, we hired a detective last year uh, and gave his primary duty to be uh, organized retail theft and kind of a liaison with the business community. Um, that's led us to do um, a loss prevention training, which we did in January. Uh, and like Chief Collins, we are trying to increase the reporting of our theft because it's vastly underreported. Um, so I guess there's only two of us in America that want that reported. But uh, it is it has been starting to uh, pay dividends as this last month we had a substantial increase in theft reporting. So we're getting there. Um, the point of doing that is so that we can actually make an organized retail theft charge, which is a felony, as opposed to uh, putting up multiple misdemeanors, which, while our city prosecutor does a great job, uh, a couple, three days in jail is is not as good as uh, what potentially the county can give, so we're trying to encourage that. Um, this has been working. We're getting some better uh, reporting. We're going to continue to do those meetings. We'll probably have one uh, sometimes this summer uh, so that we can engage 
the retailers. And lastly is Flock. Um, that's up here anyway, that uh, the businesses can provide uh, license plate reader cameras also uh, into Flock. Uh, so that way their Flock cameras, if they ping, would alert us as the police and we can use those as an additional investigative tool. Um, and so we're going to be uh, working with our retailers. I know I talked to Fred Meyer and they were very interested in being on board with this. So uh, that's another tool we have. Uh, another thing we are doing to kind of keep it with the uh, clean, safe welcome uh, that Regan talked about is uh, we have worked with the retailers, particularly the property owners, to get trespass authority so that we can trespass people when uh, the businesses are closed or when the property owner is not available. Uh, this proactive step has allowed us to kind of clean out some of the people that are just loitering and uh, that kind of really discourage the shopping experience and commit crimes. So we're getting rid of some of those people. Uh, and then obviously you'll hear from Darren later, uh, we're on the other end providing services mm -hmm. to some of the same people. So um, that's been helping clean up our business area. All right, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Flock real quick. Um, this is kind of the, the new wave in law enforcement, uh, kind of one of those, I'd almost say generational changes in, um, in policing that's going on. Uh, some of our neighboring cities have them, Black Diamond already has them. Covington uh, just recently signed a contract with them. We should have them hopefully up this summer. Um, but just to give you a quick overview of what they do is they take pictures of every license plate that goes by them. Uh, and it basically puts them in a database for us to search. Um, these things do not take pictures of people. Uh, they're not trying to do facial recognition and it is not used for traffic enforcement. So we're not using them to write red light tickets. They're not speed ticket thing. They don't do that. Uh, and so if you don't want that, these don't do it. This just tells us what the car is. So as you can see that picture there, uh, it tells us what car that is. The AI, whatever it has behind it, will tell you that's this car. And that's, you know, this, we think it's in this age range and that it's its model. So make model uh, and when it was seen. So it'll tell you how many times it's been seen. Um, again, like I said, this is a license plate recognition. It has nothing to do with the occupant of the car. We don't want to see the occupant of the car because we want the most indiscriminate evidence that we can get. Um, this is about gathering facts. So like a video camera that's posted somewhere, it is the same kind of thing. This just happens to be doing it for license plates. Uh, what it does do is alerts the officers to wanted vehicles. So if the vehicle is stolen, it will alert the officer that it's at this place and it does it uh, nearly instantaneously, um, however quickly your internet connection works. Um, and it alerts the officer right on his computer uh, so that they can go quickly uh, use that information to go affect an arrest or recover the property or whatever that is. Uh, officers can also add uh, vehicles that they have interest in. Uh, that's all tracked and audited. So it's not like you can just add uh, someone's vehicle that you want to know when they're coming through. We don't, that's not going to be acceptable. Uh, that would have your uh, ability to use it revoked. So this is purely for investigative purposes. So if we had an organized retail theft uh, vehicle that we're looking for, we want to know when it comes in the city so that we can prevent the theft, um, which uh, for us is a great tool. Uh, it's also a tool on the back end. If something does happen, we can use it to investigate. Uh, and I know here in Covington, even though we don't have it up yet, we've already used it to solve some crimes, even though it's not ours. Uh, some things this does not do. It does not tie you to personal identification. So it doesn't tell me that this plate belongs to this person. So it will not do that. We don't want it to do that. Um, it's, like I said earlier, it's not used for traffic enforcement. There's no facial recognition. And lastly, the data is stored for 30 days. So this is not an infinite uh, government database because it doesn't belong to the government. After 30 days, Flock deletes the information off of their server so that nobody can have it. Um, so that, that way it's not an infinite bank of license plates because we don't really want that. Okay, so, uh, and Black Diamond's gonna have some success stories here in just a minute. Uh, they have five license plate readers. Covington uh, will have eight when we get those uh, up and fired up. Uh, like I said earlier, the businesses can purchase the uh, license plate readers from Flock and place them wherever they choose and connect them to the police department. Uh, and the other benefit is other police departments will grant you access to their system of cameras. So for instance, when we get in there, uh, Kent has a nice web of them. I think Auburn has some, Better Way has some, and we can then become part of that network. All right, I think Commander Martinez has some success stories. And yeah, I think there's another PowerPoint uh, that we submitted. Got some data in there.
So we've had the flock system since August of 2023, and it's been a great investigative tool for us. Um, Hickey hit the high points as far as what it can do and what it cannot do. Um, but, you know, as we look into 2023 in August, when we first uh, got this, uh, we had five uh, stolen cars that were recovered. Uh, three cars ran from us. Um, as most cities are having the case. Uh, we made one arrest. Uh, in 2024 this year, so far, we've had uh, 15 stolen car hits, 29 stolen stolen license plates hits. Um, two cars are, have been recovered. Five license plates have been recovered. And four, four vehicles have fled from us. Um, he hit the high point as far as the big brother watching us. Um, this system does not do that. It takes still pictures of license plates and it notifies us if that car is wanted for whatever, whatever reason. Uh, another point that uh, that was missed was it alerts us for amber alerts or for blue alerts or for um, silver alerts. So if there's a car associated with any type of the Washington alerts or any national alerts, it'll notify that police department as well. Uh, a lot of success we've had also is the sharing of cameras. Um, Piquilla, um, Auburn, Kent, Federal Way, like you said. There's a lot of um, other departments on the east side. Um, Yakima, Richland, Kennewick, Moses Lake, Spokane um, County Sheriff's Office, they all have the, the same system and we could share our, dat our data or cameras. So if they have a hit that is say a homicide that happened recently in, in Yakima, um, they put that in the in the flock hit camera so that if that vehicle ever came through our city, our officer would be notified that, hey, there's a vehicle a homicide suspect that's in your city or a vehicle associated with a homicide in your city. Um, as far as the, the, the way we get the um, information is through either an email or through a, a cell phone text. And what I've experienced is about 10 to 15 seconds after that vehicle goes through the camera, um, it's about 10 or 15 seconds before the officer gets the notification. Uh, we have five cameras in our city. Every entrance point in our city, we have a camera. Um, one of the busiest is on 216th. So people coming from Maple Valley, usually making a ride on Covington and Sawyer and going into Covington. Um, they rarely go straight onto 10 trails, but sometimes it does. Um, but that's one of our busiest um, locations is actually 216th. So getting the cameras there at the Covington location and then hopefully Maple Valley will be on board one day and you know we could kind of solve the problems that we're all facing you know, within this region. Uh, we thought it was very important. We're super um, happy about our, our council supporting this and getting the equipment that we need to to investigate and, and to solve problems within our community. It, I think it's important. To, um, I'm a resident of Maple Valley, so everything that happens, you know, within Black Diamond, it's nine minutes door to door uh, from our workplace to my front door of my house. So it's all important, you know, and it's important that we all work together to solve the, the crime that's happening here. Because all that stuff that we say that has happening in Seattle or maybe it's happening in Kent, it's all leaking this way. And we're, we're seeing in the spike in crime. So we all have to work together to, to solve the problems. The next slide is going to show a little quick um, tidbit. I'll give you some background information on this. We had a, a hit that came through uh, coming into Tentrails, into Tentrails, and we got a stolen vehicle hit. Officers responded, uh, found the vehicle probably within a minute and a half of it hitting, uh, going into the Tentrails area, and we'll go ahead and take it away. Okay, so you're in possession of a stolen vehicle? No, 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 no. Hold on, hold on. Okay, we're we're gonna figure we're, we're gonna on. figure this out. Yep, we're gonna figure it out. Hold on. Anyone else in the car? Yeah. Okay, where, there was where, where, where? I have no idea. Let me verify. Okay, I got him. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not resisting, I'm not doing nothing. Yeah, yeah, I know you're not, and I appreciate it. So that was one success story. Like I said, about a minute and a half after it hit the camera, as officers found this guy, there was nobody else associated with this vehicle. He was the driver. He was the one that was uh, driving it, and officers were lucky enough to find him pretty quickly and arrest him. Um, of course, we have the problem when we do locate these vehicles, of the vehicles running from us. That's a statewide problem. That's a nationwide problem. Um, we're all talking as far as, uh, what we're going to do when the law changes. Uh, I don't think it's going to be a free for all. You know, back in the day, uh, you know, I've been doing this for 29 years and my former department, we used to chase until the wheels fell off. That's not the case anymore, <laughs> you know? So, you know, we really have to think about, you know, the, the public 
um, safety and so forth. And what crimes are we going to, you know, chase for? And 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 you know, there's a discussion that's happening behind the doors uh, with all the different agencies involved. So that if we chase a car into Maple Valley or to Covington, what can we expect uh, that to look like as far as backup and and vice versa? Uh, because I think every agency is going to have a a different response to that. Um, you looking uh, just talking to some of the areas back east and then also in Pierce County, I think they're going to really start going after some of these cars. And I think our, our areas are just too congested for that to happen. So, um, like I said, there's going to be discussions and we'll, we'll share that information when it comes. Uh, all right. Um, is there any questions for our police chief and commander, council member Theron? Thank you. Um, <laughs> So I know uh, you said that it's not collecting personal identifiable information, but the example you gave of if there was a murder suspect, unless the murder was done with the actual vehicle and the license plate seen, how does it tag the suspect as an individual to a license plate? So it doesn't, it doesn't tag the, the suspect to the vehicle. It only tags the vehicle. So if we got information, let's just say from Yakima, and the suspect was possibly driving this car with this license plate. That's the only information that we're going to get is the license plate. So if it hits our camera, the thing, the thing that we're going to get or the information we're going to get is this car is involved in a homicide in Yakima. And then we have to do the investigative background to see how that applies and where that connection happened. Um, so it, it doesn't, you know, pop up a picture of this guy or anything like that. It's all, you know, um, it's secure information. It's only for vehicle or vehicle descriptions. Uh, one of the things that that wasn't discussed was we could make a hot list and we don't actually need a license plate. So let's say there's a red Toyota pickup truck lifted with a home across country sticker in the back. Um, we could put that information in there. And then every time um, a vehicle that matches that description goes by, it takes a picture of it and it notifies us of that. So it's pretty intelligent um, and just the IE behind all that stuff or the AI behind all that stuff is, is pretty impressive. Um, all the information is encrypted, it's stored in the cloud and automatically deleted it, like you said, in, after 30 days. So very secure. Can I follow up with that? Who has the authority to put the information into it? Like a commander, like a, if a Amber Alert goes out, like it has to be a commander or higher. Yeah, what, what we have is a supervisor or above and we do monthly audits to make sure that we comply with their, with all the information that block has us do and then we put that in our monthly report as well as as far as the audit was complete we also do an audit of every single vehicle that was that matched a hit and then what was the outcome of that vehicle or what was the outcome the officers responded they didn't locate it or they were on a call and couldn't respond or whatever the outcome was so that we always have like an up-to-date picture of what it looks like and how it's working for our city that's smart page yeah quick question commander so we talk about how it's uh, the data is destroyed or, or eliminated after 30 days. How is that? How does that work if this data is to be used for evidence? Does it become part of a, the chain of evidence, or can you explain to us how that works if it gets eliminated after? 30 yeah, days? if it's if it's not actually used in an investigative crime, or or please don't extract that information. It goes away, but if we extract that information, of course, we're going to put it in the case report, and it, it becomes now evidence. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Yes. All right. Oh, First of all, it'd be a uh, can't let cost country emblem. But anyways, how are uh, <laughs> how are the prosecutors doing as far as making sure that your teams feel supported? I mean, are we we're not dismissing a bunch of stuff. We're not just tossing things out of court. It's a little peddly things. Are they actually prosecuting? If you don't want to answer it in the open dais, you don't have to. But I know I talked to my uh, Maple Valley chief quite a bit about this. So, uh, yeah, we have we have a great communication with our courts um, and our prosecutor as well. Um, they're they're charging these individuals, um, and and it, not just when locally, but you know when we go to King County, um, that's always a different element involved. Um, but it's a constant communication that we have to have with the prosecutor. Once we upload this case to the prosecuting attorney. It's being really diligent as far as saying, hey, this case is important to us. We really want this prosecuted. What do you need to move forward with it? Um, because if not, if that's not happening, I tell you what, it's going to slip through the cracks because of so many cases that are backlogged right now, especially at a, at a felony level. So it's really just staying on top of it and, and really contacting the, the prosecutor. But we've had success so far. Um, very few have been dismissed. Or, and, you know, if they, if they are, we're 
refiling and asking, you know, what, what more information do you need to, to prosecute this case? One thing I like about what Maple Valley's prosecutor is doing, she's doing a great job is she watches and uh, achieves their help, the Superior Court ones, and if they decline them, then she goes and pucks it back out and moves them down to the Yeah, and that's valley. exactly what's happening at a local level. And what we're seeing is at a local level, it seems like they get more of a yeah. slap on the hand or more punishment than, than they do at a felony level anyway. So yeah. it's working out for us. I, I read cities, I would highly recommend you talk to your prosecutors, your municipal ones, and our council gave our city prosecutor kind of a direction to do that. So I might want to think about that. That way people aren't just getting off of things when it gets to the superior court level. Because just like Councilman Dunn said, and he just said, is they are getting dismissed at the superior court level quite a bit on little technicalities. But when they come back to us, the local level, then they're getting held accountable. We want people held accountable when they're doing stuff. So, Absolutely. But I also like how three of you have your teams not slamming people all the time, but making sure you're educating people on things, you know, things are things that are going on. So it's, that's great because I hear that all the time too. You're spending time to educate people when they're doing things wrong. So that's good. That's what Bill says. Okay. We have one more time for one more question. Go ahead. So thank you. Uh one thing I'd like to go back to the very beginning of your presentations and, and I think you all three shared the same statement was um you felt that things were being underreported. But one consistent message I've heard from Chief Collins, doesn't matter if you're talking to local businesses or community people, and is that, and I want to just reiterate it for your sake, was the uh, don't be shy to call 911 or the non-emergency number. And if, if you wonder what if it's whether or not it's important or not, that's their job to figure that out. They'll make the determination if it's important, and then they react accordingly but unless we call all of us our individuals businesses things don't change and they're not going to be heavy-handed about it but then they get to make the decision and then that, that one weird thing that shows up at some point you said i should have called you don't worry about it they've made the decision so uh I, yes i'm i'm just glad you mentioned that but i just want to make sure everybody thinks it that way too and shares that message if you have any doubt, let the professionals make the, the final determination. All right. Thank you, each of you, for your uh, presentation from each city. Okay, so we move on to community care, human services from each of the cities. Yes, that means I'm going first. <laughs> Just a, a real quick housekeeping note before they get started. Um, for future meetings, uh, for public safety, I think we would be remiss to not include the fire portion of our public safety stool that we have as cities. So if, um, just make a note for future meetings if, if we could include the folks that provide the fire and ambulatory services. We as, do. In that at other times as well. Okay, yep. cool. Rotate. Uh, we rotate. Gotcha. All right, good evening, everyone. I'm Greta Huntley, Community Resource Coordinator for the City of Maple Valley. Um, thank you for having me tonight. Excited to be here. I got a chance to present at the last Tri-City Council meeting last year. So I'm um, happy to give an update on our programs. Um, so as community resource coordinator, my uh, position has three main areas of focus, school programs, community programs, and mental health, which of course overlaps with both school and community. Um, so I'll share some specifics about each of these areas tonight. Uh, currently, the position and programs are funded primarily through our ARPA funds, which are ending. Um, this is a partnership position with the Tahoma School District. So the district funds half of the position and the city funds the other half with the city funding all of the programs. Um, so pretty cool and unique partnership there. Um, looking forward, uh, we recently secured, as Laura mentioned, um, some funding through the Washington Healthcare Authority to continue our programs through 20, in 2025 and beyond, um, as well as um, looking at opioid settlement funding, House Bill 1590, and our general funds as well. 
So looking at our student programs, um, as I mentioned, a unique position in partnership with the Tahoma School District. Um, I work most closely with the district's wellness coordinator, um, and she and I say our motto is better together, meaning, um, you know, our work, the impact of our work in the areas of mental health and wellness is exponentially more impactful when we're able to partner on this together, support one another, collaborate, um, and build these programs in partnership. So really grateful to do that work hand in hand with Tahoma School District. Um, the heart graphic that you see on the screen is something that we created together for May as Mental Health Awareness Month. I'm um, just highlighting uh, a lot of the cool mental health and wellness programs in both our schools and communities. So you can see a lot of really cool stuff happening in this area. Um, and taking a deeper look into some of the core elements in our school programs, um, one of the big areas of focus is our in-school therapy. Um, this year, we were able to expand our services into all uh, six of our elementary schools, um, as well as our two middle schools. So um, coordinating uh, with a local mental health agency to staff in school therapists um, and fund the sessions. We were able to fund 474 individual in school therapy sessions in 2023. We're on track to exceed that number this year. We also run a financial aid program in partnership with the school district. So we work really closely with school counselors in each of our buildings. Um, they submit requests when they identify a need with low income students and families. Um, uh, support can range from student activities, sports equipment, um, instruments, things like that, to more essential needs, food and clothing, to crisis support. And in 2023, we were able to fill 227 requests and again, on track to exceed that number this year. So a lot of really good work and good help um, being given through this program. Uh, we also coordinate um, quarterly uh, wellness events and parent support groups. Um, so our parent support groups this year have focused on supporting parents or guardians with students, neurodiverse students. This has been our most popular parent support group. I mean, it like fills up in a matter of minutes. So really cool. We're in our third um, six week session of offering that group. Um, we've completed three so far. And we are mid-session for a parent guardian support group for parents of students who are struggling with substance use and addiction challenges or just looking for prevention tools. So we're three, three weeks in and have gotten some really good feedback about the impact of this group as well. Um, a lot of great uh, community education events, um, parent community education events around fentanyl, mental health, suicide prevention. We always bring in our community partners to have resources there. We wanna connect our um, families and community members with our resources on site. So that's been really great. Um, and we also fund and help coordinate a few social emotional learning programs in our schools. Um, so we'd like to highlight Roots of Empathy is a really great curriculum that school use, schools use where they bring in an infant, a, a volunteer parent and an infant starting at two to four months. Um, and they're with the, the classroom for the full year. So students get to kind of observe um, a, a baby development. They call them baby teachers. Um, it's really focused on building that social emotional skills. Pretty cool, as well as our Taproot Theater Program. This is a group that comes in and focuses on social skills and anti-bullying, and they come and do um, performances in all of our elementary schools um, every fall. So then taking a look at our community programs, um, without in-house human services, our focus is really on our community partnerships, um, partnering with community service providers to meet the needs of our evolving community, identify cap identify gaps um, and fill those gaps with, with the end goal of reaching all sectors of our community. So taking a deeper look at the core elements um, in our community programs, Laura talks a little bit about our Kindness Connects campaign. This is super fun. We run it every November for the full month, um, all about spreading kindness, um, positivity, mental wellness. So we have a different message of kindness each week for the month of November. We get council involved at farmer's markets. We have kindness cards. Um, we had a really cool uh, digital photography contest that we got community engaged in. The winner got to have their, their winning picture. I'm sure you've seen it a lot, the, the leaf with the heart in the middle um, on a billboard in town. So pretty cool. Completed our first year last November. Um, so on to our fifth. 
Uh, we also run a mental health first aid program. Um, we offer free trainings in the community, adult and youth focused. We just wrapped up a spring series and had 45 community members and some council members trained as well. It's a really great program. Um, we partner with the police department on a financial aid program called Persons in Need PIN program. Um, this is uh, gives police officers the beauty of the uh, ability to provide immediate financial support in the form of gift cards for um, minor needs as they come up. It's not intended to address chronic larger issues, but if a police officer, you know, comes into somebody who just could use a little help, will use some gas in the tank, it's a way to empower them to be able to help um, community members in need without dipping into their own pocket. Um, and finally, we uh, do a lot of work in community services. Like I mentioned with many of our partners, we facilitate uh, a monthly community service coalition. Um, we meet monthly with more than 20 providers um, and growing, some of them here tonight, um, which is a really great opportunity for us to collaborate and connect and support one another in this work, um, as well as maintaining ongoing resources and providing referrals to residents um, and our community partners. So. It's a lot of information to back into five minutes, but I'll open it up to, to questions or comments if you have anything. Yeah. Mental health first aid, you said it's for community members. Does that community include Covington, Black Diamond, surrounding areas of Canton Incorporated, King County? Well, I know that the mental health first aid program through there are a variety of different groups that offer the free trainings. Um, we've work, we work with a trainer who um, provides it just to Maple Valley residents. However, she works also with Valley Cities that provides it to all of King County. So it's really accessible to anyone. And we've we've often pointed folks to that direction there. Any yes. other questions? Thank you. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Sorry, I was just going to make mention that um, I noted that it seems like there's a lot of uh, youth focused programs and to divergent or diverse communities and so forth. And I, I realize that's because you're going you're working with the schools. Um, but one area that I see as a need that's growing and I'm just curious to know uh, programs that are focused towards the, the elderly population, the seniors, because depending on what you define as a senior, I mean, I'm in my 50s and I know some people, you know, I'm knocking on a door yeah. and I realized to get some programs and some capital facilities in place and things like that, I mean, 20 more years will be here in a snap of the fingers. So um, I guess I asked selfishly, what are, what's in the pipeline for senior programs? Yeah, great question, um, and, and I completely agree. Um, we've worked with the community center that, that runs our senior programs. Um, to when there's a need for resources and connecting their senior population to more support. Um, but I think there's a lot of area of work that we can do here. Um, we're exploring some different options for care coordination um, for the broader community and certainly supporting the senior population in that. So I think there'll be more to come. Um, but I agree with you, this is a, a sector of the community that, um, that certainly can use more support. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening. Hi, my name is Julie. I am the Human Services Supervisor here at the City of Covington. And I am Darren Patterson. I'm the City's Resident Community Care Specialist, and I'll be talking to you about our community care program. So just a quick little quick overview of our program. It's a collaborative response to requests for service from law enforcement, community partners, or community members to try to attempt to proactively uh, address certain human service needs, such as housing, shelter, mental health and addiction, domestic violence, victimization, and other uh, non-emergency related essential needs. Um, just a quick uh, review of our um, 
overview of our program from what we've served uh, 74 individuals, individual care seekers. We provided uh, 98 different care coordination services. Of that 74, group of 74 care seekers we served, 19 of them uh, required more than one service so to meet their individual needs. Um, out of that 98 care coordination services, we uh, had 422 uh, different encounters. The average number of encounters um, the services are requiring was about six, and the average length of a, each encounter was about 45 minutes. Um, as you can see, the predominant encounter method is over the phone. It's about 45% to a lesser degree in person. This is largely due to the fact that after making contact with someone, we find that much of the work lies in contacting the resource providers as we attempt to assist them with con connecting them with the resources that they need. On the right, you can see that uh, our encounter attempts have largely been successful, meaning that we've been able to uh, be established, successfully establish contact with them and the various resource providers that we reach out to. So here, um, when I begin working with somebody at the outset, one of the first things I try to do is I try to discuss with them to get them to outline what their goals are. Um, and of the goals that have been reported to me by each of these individual care seekers, the majority were related to housing and shelter. Um, and so to that point, I uh, took the data from uh, the 211 accounts um, reporting site and um, over the last few years. And um, you can see that the, uh, the Covington residents that are reporting um, seeking assistance with housing, you can see that it's slowly increasing and that the data is projecting that this figure will continue to increase as time goes on. So in response to that, um, we've begun partnering with AHA, which is Alcoholics and Addicts and Assisting Alcoholics and Addicts uh, Supportive Housing Platform, um, which is an evidence-based addiction recovery, recovery housing platform that reinforces accountability through compassionate counseling, cognitive retraining, and life skills management. There are four distinctive platforms that are intended to address a wide range of, of needs, ranging from the traditional person who just needs assistance off the street um, to a dual diagnosis program that seeks to address people with comorbid issues from mental health and substance abuse, a family platform, and a partial hospitalization for folks with greater needs. Today, I'm um, pleased to announce that we've had three of our unhoused Covington community members enroll in this program and begun working to develop an individualized care plan that met their own particular individual needs. And all of these folks are currently employed and actively working towards uh, establishing long-term housing and readjusting to a pro-social lifestyle, which is the goal. Darren does all the hard work and I just have to look at numbers, I guess. But um, uh, as far as our total funding, we have a 406,500 for all human services funding. And so this is not just the general fund, this includes everything, HB 1590, 1406, all of that. Um, of those funds, you can kind of see the breakdown here. So 38% goes to homeless support, down to 16% for behavioral health, 12% healthcare, 11% domestic violence, and then you can kind of see how it does break down. Um, so as far as are we on target with where our funding is, it kind of does look that way based off of Darren's charts and kind of what we're seeing. Uh, as far as like some larger highlights as well, um, just going through this really quick, we have the minor home repair program. While the numbers are low at six, the impact is high. Uh, this is a great service for our seniors as we've been able to keep them in their homes. And that's um, kind of to your point, sir, you talked about the senior services. This is something that we definitely do to help our seniors in this community. Um, as far as uh, the human services assessment and the funding cycle, those two are kind of closely tied. We have our funding cycle coming up this year. It's for the 2025-26 funding cycle. 
um, to ensure that we are on target with making those funding decisions and on the right track for that. We are partnering with Central Washington University for a comprehensive human services assessment. Um, that'll be broken into focus groups, surveys, and also some quantitative data collection. Um, going to the funding cycle, we have 47 applications that have been received. That is the most that we've ever received in the city. Uh, we have 810,000 in grant requests, which is again, the most that we've ever been asked for. Uh, we will started our review process um, this month with the Human Services Commission. And then the final recommendations, I stand corrected, will actually be in December, not November. Um, but with the final um, product kind of working towards the end of the year and recommendations to council. And I believe that's it. Any questions for us? Councilmember Member DeLeo. Thank you. So this, and I, I'm loving seeing all these updates from when you were presenting them last year. And I am curious to kind of uh, follow in that theme of communication. When people are in crisis mode, what does it look like to make sure that, I guess, before they actually reach the point where they want to reach out to you, what what's kind of being done to disseminate that information so that more people in Covington, in the Covington area, are aware that these are additional resources that they can go to for help? What I find effective is just outreach, being on the streets, interacting with the folks kind of where they're at and where they live and just literally going up and talking to people and just, you know, saying, hey, how's it going? You know, and, I, and a lot of people, you know, are just responsive to, to to that. And then word of mouth gets out, just some mm -hmm. memetics, you know, it spreads to the throughout their community. And um, I, I've gotten a lot of contacts from people who heard from other people. And so, you know, I find that that's been pretty effective. Yeah, I just like to, so Regan pointed out the use of our website. And on that website, we also have human services services <laughs> listed. And so I would like to think people are maybe finding them that way as well. And we have multiple ways of getting it out. We have a brochure. Um, our commission is really active in the community. So talking with other our community members. Um, in the years past, we've done resource events. Um, I personally coordinated a resource event at Covington Place Apartments for our seniors. So um, those are just some things that we've done. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, yeah. awesome. Thank you. The 47 different grants for human services, what are those comprised of? What's the range? Yeah, so are you asking? asking how much they're asking. On the last slide. You... Right, there's 47 applications. So every two years, we have a biennial funding cycle. This year, we have had 47 different agencies uh, requesting human services dollars from the city of Covington. Does that answer your question? What what, what oh. type of agencies are they? What oh. services yeah. are they providing? I mean, who makes up those 47? Yeah, so they range from like uh, mental health agencies to like health point, like physical health to um, uh, sexual assault, to domestic violence. I mean, it just really ranges. All Homeless of them, services. Are all of them just located in Covington or are they outside of Covington? Um, they are both. So we have several that apply from Covington. We have um, some from Kent. We have some from Auburn. We have um, actually some from Seattle. So they kind of all range. And then the Human Services Commission goes through every single application and kind of discusses how they could impact uh, Covington. We have a whole rating sheet. It's a very involved process. Thank you. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. All right. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. You want me to go through it? Is that person here? No. Is she online? online? Yeah. Is she online? Yes. Okay, good. Yep. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I'm I'm gonna skip this um the PowerPoint, you can take that down because I have just a short amount of time and I really want to give you some new high points. Good evening, everyone. I'm Judge Krista White Swain from Black Diamond and Two years ago, we started a therapeutic court program in the city of Black Diamond. And I've been in criminal justice in the district and municipal court level for almost three decades. 
And this is the most rewarding program I've ever been a part of. And um, the reason why is because it's creating huge change for the members of our community that have really been removed from the community. Um, earlier tonight, we heard Council Member Dunn talk about the huge rise in crime, the huge rise in fentanyl overdosing, meth overdosing, and it is a big problem in all of our communities. I'm actually at a national conference right now. I'm in Anaheim, California, where um, we just completed day one of uh, this huge conference on treatment courts, which specifically affect us because um, we're very lucky to have in Black Diamond a therapeutic court program. All of our funding comes from the administrative office of the court through the state of Washington. And we are now um, move, we have moved past grant funding and we're now in a continuous uh, state appropriation funding for this program. As part of this program, we have um, a separate therapeutic court case calendar, uh, two days a month. As part of that court calendar, um, I come out on the bench, I don't wear a robe, I am called Judge Krista. Um, everything is very informal in this therapeutic court program. Uh, everyone uses their first names. We have the prosecutor, the public defender. We also have a program coordinator, case manager, uh, Summer Johnson. Um, we have a peer uh, support counselor uh, named Jane Bond, and we have a dedicated mental health uh, therapist for this program, uh, Trent Gray. And we are so lucky to have this team, which creates a wrap around effect for the individual. Um, now, what does the therapeutic court look like? Well, we normally give the person an opportunity to have their case ultimately dismissed if they go through the whole program. It is a very intensive program. Now, giving you a, a quick example, let's say we have a theft in the third degree. It's a very common uh, case that we see in municipal court. Normally, you would see a person, um, you know, they plead guilty, maybe they do some jail time if they've had criminal history in the past, maybe they are referred to treatment with no real support to that. But in the therapeutic court program, we give them an opportunity to engage in this program. There's a very thorough assessment called the CCAT assessment done before they're ever even uh, admitted into the program. The prosecutor is the gatekeeper. Our prosecutor, Ivor Gunderson, decides who is and who is not eligible for this program. And the team works together to create uh, a whole plan that satisfies the individual participant, the prosecuting attorney who um, makes sure that the community is going to be protected, the public defender and the participant themselves. Everybody works together to create that program. And then there's weekly contact with the case manager, weekly attendance at peer support, and that doesn't even begin to scratch the surface on the type of treatment that the individual must participate in. Normally it's substance use disorder treatment. And in addition to that, we usually have a mental health component. The reason people are addicted to drugs and alcohol or both is because we have some trauma and the level of trauma that happens that creates that addiction is so varied and crosses so many spectrums. But mental health uh, support is a key part of, um, of that program. And that comes in the form of both our peer counselor support as well as our mental health support. Community service is also part of whatever program the individual does. Um, and that community service can look really different depending on what that participant's skills are and how they can offer to give back to the community. At the end of the completed program, if they successfully complete, then we have a big graduation, we have a pizza party, it's a lot of fun. We actually have a graduation coming up um, next week and we are going to be very excited to graduate one, um, one of our community members who has really, I think, been a thorn in the side of the police department. And he's made um, massive changes in his life. Um, and it's been very exciting to see his progress as he's gone through this program. Um, and so it's, this is a, 
a huge successful program that, that we have started at this point. We have 0% recidivism um, with our graduates. Um, and of course, not everybody has graduated, but you know, we've got a lot of people in the program now. We have an amazing police department who's you know, fully staffed and we're really um, you know, <laughs> bringing a lot of cases to our court. Um, and it's just a very exciting um, program to be part of. Um, you know, and and today, um, today I I spent my my day learning about um, impaired driving in therapeutic court and treatment courts and what that looks like and how to effectively, um, you know, bring people out of addiction so that our roads are safer and our communities are safer as a whole. Um, and uh, you know, again, the the imposition of jail time doesn't do anything to change. Um, the underlying problem, which is that that individual person's lifestyle choices, the addiction that they're that they're stuck in, and so with this therapeutic court and the treatment court, we can create those changes and bring that individual back into our community, so they can be a positive um, and and contributing member of our community. So I appreciate you hearing about my therapeutic court today. Are there any questions? Anybody have a question? <laughs> Go ahead, uh, Councilor Martin Jones. Yes, good evening, Judge. Um, I, this is more of a comment uh, from your previous uh, presentation we've had on this before. One thing that I thought was uh, most impressive, and I, I think a, a twist I hadn't thought of before, which is that uh, when one of the participants in the program, if they have a sort of a back step, if they have a, a hiccup, so to speak, as, as they go along through their treatment, that I think most people might think, ah, you're you're going to the slammer, you're you're done, but you're you're very compassionate, and the team does provide that reassessment and adjustment, and they keep going on that path towards success. And I think that's very very different from what I think sort of like a probationary program might be. Could you enlighten the folks here about how how it differs? Yeah. Yeah, the, the old way of thinking is that, oh, you've had a positive UA, you're going to jail, or uh, you missed your, your treatment this week, you're going to jail. Um, that just simply doesn't work to, to help uh, the individual. What we have are graduated sanctions. And so when an individual comes into the program, they are shown the, the, the grid of sanctions so that they have an expectation for if they have a positive UA, what's going to happen? So what happens if they have a positive UA? Uh, if they, you know, and, and really there's no expectation in the first 30 days of a program that a person's gonna, you know, be clean and sober immediately. This is a process, especially with the opiate problem and the fentanyl problem. It takes, it takes a village to, to get that person, you know, through detox, generally through inpatient uh, treatment, and then to, you know, a real, a start in the in their recovery. And so we expect hiccups to happen. But if if the person wants to stay in the program, then we, you know, change the level of treatment, change the type of treatment, um, add things like writing um, an, a reflection essay about what happened in this relapse or whatever happened that created uh, a sanction for the program. But uh, everyone is treated as an individual. And, and so, um, you know, one positive UA over here may look very different from a positive UA over here, depending on all of the other factors around. Um, you know, we talked about this today in the group. Oh, yeah, sorry. sorry we're really running out of time. Um, oh, yeah, I have one more person that had a question, Council Member Porter, and then we got to shut it down. Okay, thank you, Judge Point. Really quickly, what is the average length from entrance to graduation? How many graduate in a year? And what is that percentage rate, success rate? Yeah, so we have, um, of, of the people in the program, uh, we've, we have so far 100% graduation. Now, I know that, and I don't have the number at my fingertips, there may be one person that is MIA right now. Um, but but so far we've had really really good luck. Um, our first year we just had um, two participants, um, and they both graduated zero percent recidivism. Now we have about eight, and uh, we're we're doing another graduation uh, next week. Uh, like I said, and I think we've had um, 
I, I do three different therapeutic courts. And so I, I don't have all the data at my fingertips just for black diamond. So forgive me if I don't, if I am not able to give you numbers right now, um, but this is a very fresh new program. And so um, right now uh, it's, you know, of course it's very successful <laughs> because we've had a, you know, a, a small number of participants, but each of those participants that has graduated now, um, you know, are, uh, are successful and have not reoffended, and that is a huge, huge win for us. Um, and watching, so. yeah, yeah, I know right. I can go on. <laughs> <laughs> I know you can. That's pretty you, impressive. The therapy <laughs> is, is a huge, huge uh, blessing yeah. in the city of Black Diamond. Yes. Krista, you always have the the gusto to talk about it, and I love that. Um, but we got to move on a little bit. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, we are at the nine o'clock hour. We do have one uh, other thing, a uh, Women's Leadership Summit recap. I was thinking it's really short. Um, I just wanted to share really quickly that this is an example of the benefit of this Tri-City Partnership. Uh, the three cities came together during Women's History Month and created it, the first, um, hopefully, annual Women's Leadership Summit. Um, we had 69 attendees from the three different cities. We had council members and Mayor Benson from the three different cities introduce it. We had uh, some amazing speakers, Susie Benson, which is a certified Dare to Lead facilitator, Shannon Wallace, the author of We the Change. And some of the feedback we got from attendees was uh, how much they appreciated the connections with colleagues, uh, being with a diverse group of women. Uh, we also had a panel and uh, folks were really, really enjoyed that. Uh, just the connections. Um, anyways, I just want to thank all three councils for supporting the Women's Leadership Summit. And again, just an amazing partnership between the three cities. So we just wanted to celebrate it and make sure everybody um, was aware that it occurred. Can I say something really quick? Yes, um, I just want to say thanks to the city managers and to uh, Mayor Benson for releasing the staff to attend this thing. Cause you know, quite a few staff went to that. And then the regional partners that were there too. So, and more awesome job coordinating this thing. So, thank you very much for that. All right. Because we are at the nine o'clock hour, I'm just going to skip council closing remarks and adjourn tonight's meeting. Thank you, everyone, for coming and spending the evening with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.